Eric Reynolds, welcome to the show. Hey, Patrick, how are you doing? Thank you. Hey, I'm so excited to have you on the show today, and I do have to thank Murph and Morgan over at Game of Crimes for the intro. Oh, yeah. Murph and old AAA, you know, yeah. <laughs> they're my best buds, man. AAA. <laughs> yeah, Murph is going solo now. I hope all that works out for him. So far, so good. I've listened to his first couple of episodes, and I think he's getting it. I, I think he's there. Cool. It's good to know. Yep. So I'm going to start out with, you know, you kind of have a famous mom in law enforcement. You know, your mom is June Hawkins and her career, you know, was recently highlighted in, you know, the Griselda story on Netflix. She was the detective that helped take down Griselda. How much of that drew you into law enforcement, do you think? Well, back in the Griselda days, about I think it was 78, 79, I was only eight or nine years old, so yeah. I don't remember really much of my mom doing anything crazy. I knew she was a detective. She wore like plain clothes. You know, she wasn't wearing the uniform anymore because mm. at six years old, her wearing the uniform and seeing her police car was really cool for a little boy. You know, like, absolutely. Wow. You know, my mom's better than your mom. You know, type yeah. of attitude. My but, mom could kick your mom's butt. That's right. <laughs> then they're like, "Where's your dad?" I'm like, "Fuck you." You know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so then, uh. Yeah, anyways, it was really cool. And then once she got the detective bureau and started doing that um, world, she had gotten remarried at one point and to a customs agent. And then at that time, I went to live with my father a couple of years, actually okay. about a year, year and a half or so. So I came back in about 19, I think it was 80, 81. Okay. So there's some overlap there. But I was a new kid. You know, she went and snatched me back from my dad. I think she knew where <laughs> I was headed if I stayed up there with, you oh, know, boy. <laughs> a little different type of supervision and dedication to education and stuff like that. Oh, so, uh, okay. But she right. snatched me back. You know, she had custody anyways. So it wasn't yeah. like a kid. She didn't go kidnapping me or anything. <laughs> but yeah. It was, uh, the. I remember her being involved in the uh, pillowcase rapist stuff in the mid or early 80s. Okay. Guy going around doing that with pillowcases and stuff. And I remember her being involved in those task forces and seeing the stories on the news and knowing my mom was part of those cases. Wow. That was, that was about 12, 13. So that's when it was kind of like really hitting home. Yeah. And, and some of her, uh, you know, some of her boyfriend, you know, she, if she was had a boyfriend, which she didn't have many, but if she did, it's probably a cop. Right. So right. we would be, sh you know, talking about stuff. And, you know, I was just always surrounded by it. You know, I had coaches that were cops with my mom, football coaches, you know, I had neighbors. I mean, it was just she had eyes on me, regardless, <laughs> you know, me having pops around. Right. But yeah, it was pretty cool. My mom here, she is this cool cop. I had football coaches always asking, hey, has your mom seen anybody? And I'm like. Dude, you can't hang. You don't even want to touch that. She's dating Dirty Harry right now, and you're, you got a you got a whistle, right? So, so it was it was pretty cool, you know. And she was, you know, always a very pretty lady, and you know, I would see her always getting attention, you know. And I right. never thought about how that attention she would get, how it would affect her in her career to later on, and what I'm talking to her and the chauvinistic stuff that was going on. As a sure. young kid, you're not thinking about stuff like that, you know. So. Yeah, it was pretty, un I guess, looking back, very unusual. But yes. at the time, it was just how things were, you know? Wow. Now, where did you grow up? Miami? Yeah, down in Miami, Florida. I went to Miami Palmetto Senior High School, Go Panthers. Um, that's actually where some like famous people went to school, like Jeff Bezos. And, oh. And I think our new, yeah, definitely our newest Supreme Court justice actually was my class president in my senior year. So, oh, wow. Not, Look at you. not that I support her <laughs> politics, but we did graduate together. She was always pretty cool back then. So, that's all I can say. Um, anyways, it was a very, you know, middle class school. You had some rich kids, poor kids, you know, nice mixture, like kind of yeah. like what you would see on TV. You know, I had a lot of insecurities like every young boy does. I didn't sure. drive the coolest car. I didn't have, you know, I was always trying to date the, you know, prettiest girl or get her to notice me, all that stuff. And meanwhile, my mom's out there being a hostage negotiator doing <laughs> like she went on some uh, chick or rooster raids and stuff, wearing a mask, jumping fences and stuff. And I'm like, here she are. You know, here I'm trying to survive in football practice and she's out doing me, you know, out there on the road. So <laughs> it, it, I always joke around with her and Al in the house. I'm the third best cop in the family. You know, it's always <laughs> tough. You know? Now she so. was my, it's a little confusing. The Miami police um, 
structure. You know, there's Metro Dade. Is that what it's called? Or Miami Metro? Or how does that work? It was Metro Dade my whole life until oh, okay. they decided to change it to Miami Dade Police Department. Oh, okay. you know, they're, they're technically the sheriff's office of Dade County. But years ago, something went down. They changed their uniforms to brown instead of green. And, mm. the you know, the doo-doo brown, as they call it. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had brown uniforms up for our sheriffs for ages, and then they went to the cool black colors, which is great in the winter, but not so great in the summer. Yeah, it's kind of nasty. So you grow up in Miami. Your mom's this cop. Now you're a child of divorce. You know, kind of going off the track just a little bit. Yeah, what advice? Looking back, what advice do you have for parents that are getting divorced or divorced? to make things a little bit easier for their kids. Nowadays, I, I don't know, man, where I'm trying to be a parent, you know, with my two kids and I'm still married and happily married. So it's like trying to manage that is hard enough, but going back, I was always involved in stuff, you know, um, I didn't have a lot of downtime for me to get into trouble, you know? So if I, you know, I was a latched key kid for a little bit where I would come home and have my mom would have a, you know, in the series that talked about her writing memos. Well, I was the first one getting memos and it was always <laughs> do dishes, do the laundry, do the garbage. So I had like an hour of chores and then it was like, tight, do your homework, then you go outside and play. So by the time I got outside, she's pulling in the driveway, you know, she had it down, you know, I wasn't ready for her skills, you know, and <laughs> little different things um after school programs you know i went to the ymca and mm. you know and back then and i played like i said a lot of sports so obviously practice was after sports and you know she made partnerships with other parents about drop-offs and sure in case you know i wasn't a, you know i had police cars pick me up and bring me home sometimes because she was running late you know or how cool is that practice. <laughs> yeah it was, i didn't realize it and now they'd be telling everybody filming you and telling on you but yep it was just you know, it was just a different way, you know, but I, what I would say is you got to keep them busy and she would still communicate with me, you know, when right. we had those moments, you know, and sit down with me and talk and she picked me up. Actually, I was up here in Tennessee getting my truck oil chain and she came and picked me up to go to lunch and go to Lowe's so I can carry the bags of soil like I always did when I was a kid. <laughs> so she scoops me up and it's like I'm getting in the car again. I was like, man, I almost feel like I should have my backpack on and yeah. just telling you about my day. You yeah, know? That's, how, that's how it was. I was cool so, today. That's right. Oh, but yeah, that's... it was uh, she changed units too when I was there. She went to like robbery and then I think she was in sexual battery for a while. But all along all through school, I had different football coaches or some coach that was connected to my mom. They yeah. had eyes, eyes on me all the time. And I think that's super important. You know, I hear parents, it's like, well, I have to give them their space, their privacy, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, absolutely not. You know, your nose should be in their business. 100%. You know, I'll, and you know, they get to a certain age and it's like, their friend groups are so much more influential than you. You know, that's whoever they're hanging out with. That's they're making a lot of decisions based on that. But like you said before, being in sports, being having accountability, you know, there's I can't say enough good things about that. Yeah. And she was um, she was in my business. She used to always tell tell me, like, I'm not going to release a monster in society. Yeah. I have a responsibility <laughs> to create. A, a manageable human being, you know, and she would run background checks on my friend's parents' house. She do, you know, calls for service just to see what was going on. All this stuff I found out later. And That's she'd be awesome. like, "Yeah, you can go to Johnny's house, but you can't go to Tina's house." And <laughs> later on, I found out Tina's mom was a holster sniffer, so that's why she didn't <laughs> want us over there. So, all kinds of different things would come up from these background checks. Not to say you got to do it on all your parents, but you should right. know who your parents. I mean, your friends' parents are. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Be, in I today's mean, you got to know age, that. Yes. You know, people are almost too less daxical with that kind of stuff. I mean, don't be a weirdo about it, but geez Louise, you should know who your kids are hanging out with. If they're going to be spending the night at some house, have an idea of who the parents are and what they're all about. You know I mean? It's, yeah, I was brought up polar opposite where both my parents were immigrants. My dad worked all the time. I never saw him. My mom worked as well. I was a latchkey kid. And it was my brother and myself. And there was no such thing. It's like, hey, you know what? The neighbor wants us to go over for a sleepover. My mom's like, she's never heard of that. 
you know, she was from a different country and the stuff that I thought was normal, she's just looking at me like, what? You know, so I grew up completely different than a lot of my friends. And you know what? It's like my friends would come over and it's like, what language is your mom speaking? And I'm like, English. She just has a really <laughs> thick accent. Yeah, it just that it's just it was a whole different ball of wax, but you know, that's that's what makes you, you know, so be it. That that's life. So, you know, speaking of kids, you know, your mom's growing up. I mean, you're growing up, you know, your mom's kind of has a very unique job and you know, she's working on big cases and she's a a female detective. There wasn't a lot of that going on back in that time period. What did the what did your like friends say? They were they thought it was really cool. And then their okay. moms would always think it was really cool. You know, if they <laughs> sure. could ever get my mom stopped at a, you know, a little party or something and they just start talking. I'm like, you know, you know, cops, you're always like, you got stories, yep. right? So All especially right. from a female's perspective, she could really entertain and tell some, you know, just truthful, honest stories. And it's just fascinating to other people. But yeah, my friends, you know, they're usually football type, you know, they were my gang or my athlete buddies, you know, right. I had some buddies that were into like smoking weed, so they wouldn't come over, you know, they're like, <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know, I'll see you at so-and-so's house, they're all worried and stuff, like, that's the cop house, you know, and yeah, you know, it's definitely different, you know, when I see how my friends grew up and like you said, the influencing was very big with me. She was able to at least surround me enough with positive people that were going places and if there was anything negative about somebody or something, it would be mentioned sure. strictly and openly without, and this right. is how it is. I mean, yep. you know, so. Oh yeah. So, you know, did you ever sense the danger of your mom's job? Like as you were growing up, you know, from like a kid to your teen years, et cetera. It's like, okay, she, she's not a cashier at the grocery store. She's, you know, she has a pistol and she's, be, she's putting herself in some pretty dangerous situations you know, not just like the cartel stuff, but just being a cop period is a dangerous, you know, ball game. Now, did that ever affect you? Do you think as a child or, or your teen years, or did you think about it or talk about it? Um, One of the things there was like, I remember one time as a youngster when she was going off to work, I was doing the old holding onto her leg thing. I think I may have been five, five or six. Yeah. She's leaving with a uniform and that probably broke her heart, but no. At the time, I didn't know. I'm just a little kid. And then later, I, you know, all that cartel stuff, I was so young, you know, I was playing with whatever, you know, evil Knievel and stuff yeah. like that, you know, and just evil being Knievel a stuff. boy, man, you know, I was tackling and I was outside playing with my friends. And so she did a great job of like having this other side of life for me to see that I didn't know what she was going through. So she was able to hide that pretty well, you know, and then obviously as <clears throat> I got older, and then realizing that uh, I think about I think it was 1981 or 1982, one of her best friends, Cheryl Seiden, was killed, mm. and she they went to the academy together or yeah. they were best friends. And she's actually on the wall up in D.C. But she was off duty with her girlfriends, coming from the movies or something. And these couple of these thugs tried to rob them, and when she was getting her gun out, trying to exchange, you know, hey, fuck you, you're not gonna rob us. Yeah, yeah. She ended up shot through the neck, oh. paralyzed, and ended up dying of pneumonia, or you know, all the other complications. Oh. Yes. And I remember we took a trip to Colorado for like a month or two. I had some friends out there, I guess, friends I didn't know about. Yeah. And we went out there and spent time away, you know, and it was fun for me. I got to, you know, play with horses and goats and oh, all kinds yeah. of stuff, be a farm, you know, like a farm kid. Yeah, but meanwhile, they're not in Miami. Yep. <laughs> no, meanwhile, she's actually just trying to get over the loss of her friend. You know? Was she and, there when that shooting happened? No, but she did visit her in the hospital. I mean, it's all mm -hmm. off duty. Yeah. So that was the thing. And, you know, and it was just, that's probably still messes her up to this day. She probably really hasn't. Oh, I'm sure Th that's tough about it, especially yeah. back in their day. You know, there was, oh. a, they didn't talk about anything. No, was, no, no, no. You're a wimp if you do. And then sure. if you're a female cop on top of it, you almost have to overdo it. Yeah. You know, to prove yourself, you know, that kind of thing, because I was lucky enough. My first partner on the job was a female. So I had a bird's eye view of what life was like for a female cop. And I was in shock. You know, I'm not going to let too, <laughs> I'm not going to talk too much about that. You know, the show is about you, but the whole chair thing, I remember you from the interviews, yeah. I yeah. witnessed that one time. And I was like, I was so aghast by that and so disgusted, you know, it's like, and it was our boss. 
Yeah. And I'm like, you are such a piece of shit. I cannot believe you're what you're doing right now, but we'll leave that for another day. But anyways, you know, your mom at one point, she had a contract out on her, didn't she? I don't know. I've heard that, but I haven't yeah. actually ever confirmed that. And we weren't hard to find. So I think if it was any weight to it, they could have. I mean, I would think, but I mean, back then all I had, I mean, maybe that's good. My name was different than hers at the time because yeah, there you go. I was like undercover back then. <laughs> Your undercover son. That's right. So you go to high school in Miami. Did you go to college right away? Yeah, after I got um after I graduated high school, I was a big, you know, thing I'm going to go play football, so I ended up Oh, okay. ended up uh sending my tapes out and my high school girlfriend at the time with one of those baton twirlers with fire and really like Sweet. big times. So she ended up going to Florida State. Mm. So now I'm like, "Ah, let me go to Florida State." So I started up there not playing football. And then I ended up uh missing football so much cuz I'd been such a huge part of my life. And watching it on that level, I was like, sure. man, the lights, you know, Miami was big. We were on a really good team. And I was like, yeah. so I ended up walking on at Valdosta State, a Division II program about an hour and a half away in Georgia. So I played there for about, I don't know, it's kind of funny, about three months until they found out I wasn't enrolled. No. I didn't know how to enroll in a different school. You know, oh, I was looking out. There was a lot of bumps in the road back in my early days. <laughs> you so, were an undercover college kid. <laughs> that might be the name of some book one day, maybe. There you know. go. But yes. yeah, I ended up going back to Florida State and uh, where the girl dumps, you know, dumped me for uh, the, oh my God, the drum major. You'll love that. She oh. ended up marrying the drum major, the guy. Doo, Ouch. Doo, doo, doo. <laughs> yeah, right? For a football <laughs> star. Oh, it's crushing. <laughs> nah, she's great. He's great. You know, um, They've been together forever. I mean, it was, yeah. hey, it worked out and it was great. But anyways, I graduated from Florida State. It took me six years. You know, I worked my way through. At that time, my mom got promoted to sergeant, went back to road patrol. You know, that goes no more overtime. Yep. You know, so I took out loans like every kid does and stretched them out as best I could and graduated in 94 and then got okay. into catching shoplifters. Nice. And that was my first job out of college. So, so what was your degree in? Criminal justice. You know, I okay. did a little minor in business because I thought I might go to the security business side of things, you know. Right. Now, did you like have this like calling to law enforcement? Some people say, you know, obviously with your household, you know, you're surrounded by it. It's kind of hard to get away from it. You know, some people say they have a calling. It's almost like a religious thing or, you know, was it anything like that for you or you're just like, hey, this is just a normal career path for me? It was, I was always like the neighborhood policeman. I mean, one of my buddies, Steve Covino, referred me. Uh, he always had to be on the lookout for the eye of the Vato, which <laughs> meant like there's always somebody up to something, right? And <laughs> obviously getting into retail theft, you see it. I mean, you know the look when someone's planning something. They, oh, absolutely. They, dead giveaway, right? And your heart starts pounding. Yep. But anyways, as a kid, I was just always involved. I would, you know... There were several bullies I would come across to stop the bullying and then things. Yeah. And I, like yourself, I was taught how to box at a young age, not at a gym, but just by a, by one of my mom's, you know, husbands. And yeah. my dad taught me and I learned how to do judo. So I learned how to some takedowns. I played football. So I was a pretty tough kid. I could take a shot. So, you know, that's just kind of, you know, was my life. And I always was one to make a difference. If something wasn't going right, I'd say something, you know, someone mistreating somebody and lying at us, you know, I, I'm not going to sit there and let you right. humiliate somebody in front of me. Um, so anyways, yeah, that's how I kind of got, I was always one to get involved. Never thought I'd be, you know, a cop. I thought I'd go apply the feds. That's when my mom was like, go, go to customs, go to FBI, yep. go to here, get a federal job. That's what she kept thinking. Right. And I tried, you know, but you know, what am I going to do with my college degree? I got no law enforcement experience. I'm not a military, you know, experience guy at this point. I'm just a college kid. And they still haven't called me back. I mean, it's yeah. been 25 years. <laughs> I think so, their window of opportunity is closed. I'm sorry. Sorry to break the news to you, buddy, but I think that door is closed. That, that window is shut. But I think get the I'm sorry, I was gonna say the FBI letter was a little thin one to say said uh if you don't hear from us in 18 months, consider yourself out of the process. So. Well, you're lucky they even did that. I mean, I graduated from college in 88 and there was like a career fair, and one of the like tables was the FBI. So I go over there. I'm like, well, that'd be cool. I have my sociology degree and my minor was criminal justice. Of course, they're going to want me. 
Yeah. So yeah, I go to the table and I explain, and they're like, what was your major again? I tell them and they're like, we're looking for accountants and lawyers right now. Sorry. You know, it's like, we don't want cops. And I'm like, oh, well, that just shattered my uh, ideals here. But what are you going to do? I got that same thing. Accountants, lawyers. And back then there was this other thing. They were like computer programming or something. You know, who would have oh, thought, yeah. thought that that was going to turn yeah. into Who'd something? Who would have thunk it, yeah. <laughs> of all the things I was wasting my degree on, right? It, it, so. Yeah. Yeah, all the nerdy kids that had the, the computer uh, whatever fill in the blank job, um, majors when I was in school, they all live on some private lake and drive really nice cars and have like two or three boats and I'm like, yeah, yay sociology. Where we go? There, right. So, you know, you get out and you start doing retail security. Now, what I find interesting about that is I've had a lot of guests on this show who've gone on to like really big stuff and a lot of them started in retail security. It takes a lot of balls to walk up to somebody after they stole something. You're out in the parking lot and it's like, excuse me, sir or ma'am, you know, do you have anything that you didn't pay for? And you don't know what the reaction is going to be. Are they going to start bawling? Are they going to start fighting? Are they just going to run? Are they going to punch you in the nose? I mean, it's completely filled with unknowns and you're not armed. You don't have anything. The gift of gab is all you yes, got. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I do you think that was like an excellent training ground for you to become a cop? Yeah, I came out even though in high school I would, you know, I could be like the team captain and call out the roster at our pep rally. But I wasn't one to go sing and dance in front of everybody. I was still <laughs> still very shy. But getting into the retail security thing, like you said, I remember the first time I walked out with my manager to do a stop. And I go, Bert, I'm sorry, security, you know, and had my little ID because you didn't want to freak people out that you weren't legit. Right. And I said, I need our merchandise back. And she was like, I didn't steal anything. And she just walked away. And I was like, what do I do now? <laughs> I thought she'd give it up or something. All the other training videos, they cried or something. They gave it back. She just walked away from me. And then the manager took over and re-asked and the girl pulled it out and then learned how to get him back without the cuffs. You know, I learned how to talk big dudes back by threatening them or saying hey man i got two cops on bike units right around the corner if i call them you're going to jail if you come back with me i'll trespass you from the store i just gotta you know sign some have you sign some paperwork and you're out the door and he's like all right man and he sit down and i call the cops hey you gotta get here fast man this guy's gonna freaking kill me you know and they show up and he's like man you lied i go but you're a thief you know so you're going to jail you know and you learn that you learn how to just kind of fight and i learned how to fight shoplifters and take downs pepper spray i got hit by a car that hit me one time and i got stitches oh, in my arm geez. they were trying to you know stealing loads of jeans back then levi's yeah running out the doors and stuff and it was just it was the wild west back in the 90s we could chase them through stores till we got our merch it was insane wow. man it was so much fun <laughs> yeah you know it's Thinking about that now, I I think most places, their policies don't even go after them. You know, you could confront them and then it's like, if they want to walk away, let them walk away. Yeah. I don't know how it would handle. I, I don't think I, because I'd be the guy, man, Reynolds got freaking 20 apprehensions this month. Yeah. Because <laughs> everyone went to the hospital after I apprehended them. So, <laughs> well, but yeah, that was fun. I learned how to manage people. You know, I became a supervisor yeah. in my own store. Okay. I learned how to delegate. I learned how to, you know, do scheduling and deal with uh, GMs and corporate people. So all of a sudden, I was forced out of my comfort zone, talking in front of a store full of people about loss prevention stuff. Mm. I'm like, all right, I'm getting better at this, you know, getting more, more confident. You know, even at 25, I was still working on myself in life. I didn't know what I was going to do yet, you know. So, yeah, that was by far one of the best jobs that I had to prepare me. And like you said, you get to know cops. I get to know how to yes. write a report, some statue stuff you have to write in sometimes, you know, and you just start, you get into that culture. And that was my, you know, step in. Did you ever have to testify in court when you were a security guard? Yeah, I actually lost pretty much almost lost my job over it because they found really? a guy not guilty and he was suing me civilly. It was oh. uh, the judge decided, ah, I can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. It was one of those cases where I, it was a floor case where I saw him pocket the earrings in his pocket and walk out the door. Yeah. You know, and then they just, I guess they said I couldn't prove it hundred percent. So he was not guilty. And then he, you know, started suing us. So it was like, I'm getting sued over a legit case. But <laughs> wow. Yeah. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. That's so, I mean, you're chasing bad guys. You're, 
talking, you know, your way out of things and into things, you know, that's a perfect training ground. And, and Hey, you're testifying court to boot and you're getting sued. So you're like a real cop. I mean, we do all that, you know, that that's, that's normal for us. Yeah. And then I, um, I went to another store, a little more money. It was another big chain. It was, um, slower a lot more high-priced items or ah. cases who were bigger and i remember coming from boyden in south florida it's a little bit of a rough area and when i got to boca man these girls are stealing all these handbags i mean thousands of dollars man and i saw them wow. coming in car sitting outside i was already trained i ran out the door i'm on the radio and <laughs> man those girls they got all these bags in their hands and one of them's the driver well she didn't make it to the driver's seat and <laughs> here i got two girls sitting down in custody and i got twenty thousand dollars worth of merchandise and they're like who is this guy he's like super shoplifter <laughs> catcher right and got all these awards and i started thinking ah, maybe i'll go up the corporate ladder in the security world you know i'm getting yeah. a lot of experience you know, no pension, though. I was a little worried about corporate mm. takeovers and being laid off because security is always an expense. I was always, you right. know, they, they cut security. They cut. And if I got up too high, salary too high, you know, just like if you're not protected by a union at your department, you, yeah. you're expendable. So that always sat with me. And then I started uh, applying as a cop. OK, Figuring how did that work out for you? At first, not good. Um, okay. I guess the, all the marijuana history that was still in my within my five years of leaving college, because this is like the late 90s, 98, okay. 99. You had to write it whether you smoke um, after age 21. Well, I graduated 24. I mean, my senior night. Me too. <laughs> I've spoken out of a bong swimming in the Florida State Fountain, running from the <laughs> FSU cops, man. So it's not even like it was a smooth event I could lie about. So when I started telling the truth, oh, you know, you smoke weed after 24, doors started closing. Well, mm -hmm. then I did what every cop would do. And I started saying, well, I smoked after age 24, right? That was the rule then. Hey, okay. I smoked, you know, sure. <clears throat> and I started failing polygraphs because uh -huh. I was lying and I wasn't good at lying, you know, and right. I mean, white lies, you know, whatever, save someone's feelings. But overall, it was hard. And in my mom's own department, I failed two polygraphs. Couldn't oh. even get there. Here's the star cop's son. Can't even get hired because it was a pothead, right? So then. I'm like, what am I going to do? And then one of her friends was, uh, she had retired and was a commander down at Sunny Isles Beach Police Department on the beach. And they were hiring dispatchers. Okay. And I was like, she's like, hey, it's a good way to get your foot in the door. If they like you, they'll possibly respond to you in the academy. It was a very small department, like 25 guys maybe. And so I was like, ah, I'll get my foot in the door. So I dispatched for about six months, you know, and <clears throat> it was whew, when all those dispatching schools. So, I mean, if you guys ever want to, sit through some stuff go to a 911 like dispatching school especially if you're ever going to be a supervisor and you're going to hear some freaking i mean just gut wrenching phone calls oh, okay, that these sure. ladies have to deal with you know we've seen it in our eye but these are like across the board just it opened my eyes to what they, they go through which helped me later on to have more compassion and empathy for them so sure. i would be fuck you dispatch you know right yeah like, sometimes that can be uh yeah yes <laughs> Not that I don't deserve it, but I was getting, you know, from the ground up understanding from the back end. All right. This is how dispatching is. County calling me if I'm not paying attention, you know, all this stuff. Right. And then I called <clears throat> Boynton Beach where I would caught all those shoplifters and said, hey, you guys hiring dispatchers. You know, by now my background was open, so I couldn't lie to other departments. Sure, sure. It was there because I'd already gotten caught. They went and pulled the background from Miami Day and it didn't match up. So I got disqualified. So. I knew what was happening, so I didn't apply at Boyden. They were going to reject me sure. based on marijuana. So I asked about dispatch. And they're like, we're not hiring dispatchers, but we do have a, a civilian job called, it's like a PSA, a public service aid. Yeah, okay. But it was a community service officer position, they called it. And all you do is you help out with traffic, traffic crashes, and non-in-progress calls or something. Maybe you help out on burglary, dust for some prints or sure. some shit you don't make a lot of money you're not sworn so they weren't as strict on the marijuana history ah. so i was like hey you know and i knew these guys so i submitted my app and i got hired as a community service officer and that's when i started in january of 2001 and by far the best training i could get in my department because i learned how to do traffic crashes i learned the radio and i learned geography without the pressure of carrying the belt or the gun belt, you know, and then having to act and be in a situation of taking control is an easy way to step into that world. And we ended up having over 20 something cops go that route after myself and uh, officer Joe Crowder 
were the first two CSOs to graduate from the academy and become oh. cops. Okay, yeah, um, because <laughs> like where I worked, we started. I retired in twenty, and I think we started the CSO program maybe about five years before that. Okay, and I tell you what, like you said, it was excellent training, and a good chunk of them went on to be cops. Some of them didn't because they physically couldn't do the PT or whatever limitations that they had, or they just didn't want to be cops. You know, it's right. like, okay. But, you know, it was, I think they made like 40 grand a year, something like that. And they turned out to be really good cops because they learned all the stuff you said. Plus they learned the culture. They know when to say what, you know, when not to say, you know, something, you know, who to approach if they need, you know, X, Y, or Z. And, you know, and they're dealing with the community. Again, they're learning how to talk to people. Yeah, and I learned, you know, when you're doing crime. So a lot of cops knew me from the catching shoplifting days. So I was already coming in as, oh, that's that old uh, shoplifting guy. <laughs> and then, you know, I knew uh, one of the guys that I caught shoplifters with, Joe, that I went to the academy with. He was um, was the CSO, too. So I learned, like I said, so much. I learned the bosses, which ones were jerks. Which sure. cops are jerks? What cops are cool? What records right. girl you wanted to talk to to get something done? Exactly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That some would yep. tell on you, you learn the hard way. So, you know, you were, like you said, the culture was by far the biggest thing I learned. And yep. every cop that came out of that was pretty much an outstanding, very thorough cop because to do traffic crashes and, you know, you're reporting to the traffic unit, you go to THI school, you don't may not go to all three levels. That's what we have in Florida. There's like a three level okay. THI school. You go to the first room, you learn at scene, you learn, you know, Hey, these accidents can come back to bite you if you don't do it right now, especially in civil cases. So oh, yeah, you just get kind of brainwashed into that. So I got real good at my reports, real good at diagramming. And this is before computers, you know, so you said I had to do yep. the line, my blue blitz, you know. <laughs> so I ended up uh, making extra money on the side from the cops that needed me to do their diagrams. They'd, oh, they'd, very cool. Yeah, they might buy me, you know, a monster or two or yeah. maybe a burrito or <laughs> something. So it was a nice niche to have, you know, and I always thought that's where I was going to go. I was going to get better at traffic. I knew the traffic unit. I knew those guys. I looked at the future of like, man, every THI guy I know ends up working for an insurance company later on. Right. So that'd be good back to, you know, you know, another career possibly. So I would, when I was on the road, I was traffic guy. I would pull everybody over. Didn't mean I rode everybody, but right. I'd have warnings. I had more warnings than anybody. You know, I'd write the ticket. If you were speeding, no seatbelt, I'd write to the seatbelt. You know, I did sure. all those games to help people out. And if you were dirty, I got you. I mean, that's just the way it was. And they were dirty. And I caught a lot of guys. And I thought I interviewed for the traffic car spot. I got second place, but I was only there for three years. So I was like, hey, you know, it'll happen. And then a bike unit for this community, uh, like city redevelopment. They called it the CRA came in and said we're redoing downtown and we want to hire our own cops that are just assigned to downtown they'll fund it so we got funded and there was uh four openings and i put in for it and you get a new car you get a new bike and at that time we didn't have take-home cars okay so i was like man i'll take that you get a take-home car yeah bicycle what i could ride a bicycle i love mountain bike and i was like this is my dream this is the closest <laughs> to be a professional i could ever get and apply for it and got it and next, here we are, 2006. I'm a cop about four years, you know, and I'm in the special unit. And I'm like, all right. That's awesome. What I'm going to do. Yeah. You, you know, civilians don't understand the value of the bicycle cops. And I didn't as well. You know, we we just started getting bike cops. I was working 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. And I was a sergeant in charge of, you know, a shift of about 23 coppers. And more than half were like special cops you know, on special, whatever. And I had my own bike unit and I didn't know anything about bicycles. I mean, I knew how to ride one. I love motorcycles. Yeah. It's like, why are they pedaling when you can have an engine go vroom, vroom, you know, that, that's what I like doing. And they were going out there, they're getting more drugs, more guns, and they're responding to stuff quicker than the cars were. I mean, these guys, we call them our wolf pack. You know, they'd be like six of them rolling down the street. And it's like, you know, a, some call would come over, you know, man with a gun, man with a knife, you know, blah, blah, blah. Nine out of 10 times, they beat the cops in the squad cars. I was in shock. You know, they're going through backyards and I'm like, all right, now I really see the value of these things. They're, they're super awesome. 
Yeah, it was like you said, we would help vice out. They're like, hey, we're going to go do a drug buy. Can you guys, you know, hang out? And I yep. freaking, man, I had a helmet on. It was bringing back the good old days, man. Yeah. I put, tuck and freaking wrap these guys up. It was yep. great, man. And great exercise. Like you said, we rolled up on so much stuff, you know, and, you know, there's you now people would like be envious envious of us because you're not handling calls per right se. you're not like asleep to the radio right so they would hate that you know you'd hear some shit by other bosses and guess what happens those bosses get promoted to bigger bosses and next thing you know my bike unit is no longer a bike unit oh all those contacts we were making about drugs and getting tips we would hand out these cards community action cards all free stamps the mail it back to the PD. Just rat your neighbor out. Who's dealing drugs, oh, okay. prostitutions, yeah. or suspicious activity? But that's what always turned into drugs. Um, right. And then we started doing vice stuff. Started trash pulls. We started doing search warrants, and then we became a vice unit. So now I'm driving around unmarked cars, doing takedowns of drug dealers, and mm. following SWAT team after they clear a house, going in and shit. I was like. Man, I like that community biking thing because I was talking to people. We were doing bike rodeos at school. Okay. You know, I was talking to kids and all of a sudden be thrown back on this end. It was a great experience, but I didn't put in for vice for a reason. I didn't want to work till 4 a.m. Right. I didn't want to have a crazy boss that right before we're supposed to get off duty would get in a car chase and be a total <laughs> cluster. And then it falls on you. And now you got a whole, you know, you got back then, what was it? Singular wireless. I got the whole store in the back of this car. Well, guess who's not going home now? It's not even my case, right? So all that <laughs> shit was going down. So, you know, and then I ended up... um they disbanded that again because we got okay. short on the road. They wanted to change our zone units to districts. Okay. So here we are. We got to pick so a district. How so. big of a department were you working at? About 160 man department. So okay, on a particular for, shift, there'd be 12 guys on a shift. Roughly. So for a city of what size? Like what population? We got 100 and shit. We're almost 200,000 now. Oh, we're wow. Un, that's a, that's a we're small understaffed. department. Well, they say we're 160, but we're retirement, and we also have a lot of Canadians. So it's like half the year we're busting at the seams, and then oh. the other half we're not. So it depends who's in charge of the budget, right? So oh, okay, I get it. And now. we've all so, we we went seven years without a raise when I was there, and then three years oof. we just freaking negotiated forever. I mean, I think I I did it the other day. Out of 19 years that I was there, I got a pay raise seven years. Wow. Yeah. Obviously and and everyone that, suffered 2008 everyone suffered i i get that but the, you know not to get a race to like 2015 it's just like holy geez, cow. You know? now let me i'm guessing you did not have a union we have a union the pba we would still fight not a very good the, one uh, <laughs> if it's well, what was like, the sheriff's office is the big dog in town so they got the deep pocket so anybody that was worth a shit at our department well, they would probably leave, right? They get trained wow. to become okay. certified at motors or whatever. And now they yeah. go over there and they're making, you know, three, you know, a half percent more or whatever it was an hour back. You know, guys were walking away a hundred thousand. We were at 60,000. So Oof. I was already so far along in my career at 40 something years old. I'm like, man, if I switch to the sheriff's office, that's a 30 year retirement. You know, I'll Oof. be one of those seven year old bailiffs at the courthouse. Yeah, so I was like, I'll, no. I'll stay the course. I'll do my 20, get out with a small enough pension to live off of and keep and get into something else. But yeah, I didn't, uh, it was a small department, but overall it's a, it's a little big city. We have rich, okay. poor beach shopping centers. We got everything. So that's why okay. all our guys are so experienced. They get snatched up by other agencies. Cause ah, we're, already, okay. we're seasoned vets by the time they leave our department or at so, least there a couple of years. So. A jack of all trades. Now, you became an FTO after how many years? I never became an FTO. Oh, I thought I, you were. Oh, well, okay. what well, I got shot. <laughs> well, yeah. The, well, that will do it. Uh, <laughs> well, I'd, so I'd already gone to FTO school. And oh, okay. what you would do at this point was you only have, let's say, eight FTOs, right? Yeah. So then you got to apply to the FTO program. Or in the middle of applying for those opening slots in the FTO, pro, FTO program, because that's your way to supervisor. Usually you get the FTO stuff done and then you figure out like you're kind of managing one person and then you learn how to manage more people. Sure. But, you know, I got into my shooting and just never hmm. went back to it, you know, and okay. got into evidence and then rode the evidence out. Were you voluntold to go to FTO school or did you want to? 
No, I wanted to. I, I maxed out all the uh, classes I could, you know, okay. to get the extra. We would get, I think, 130 bucks extra a month if you maxed out your credits, whether it was college and then the extra, you know, organized crime and radar and laser and all that stuff. And, right. you know, I had gone through all that. So it okay. was nice to get the chance at evidence. So that showed up at a good time. So your career is chugging along. You know, you, you've had quite the variety of stuff that you've done. Now, right. can you kind of take us through where, how many years were you into your um, police career when you did get involved with your shooting? It was 2012. So I guess I was sworn in 02. So about 10 years, 10 around years. the average, that 10 to 12 year mark they always have in the statistics. Yes. But, you know, a veteran, you know, and, you know, you know what you're doing, you feel comfortable right. doing the job. And could you kind of walk us through what happened that day? Yeah, it was a regular, it was a, it was Tuesday, June 12th, 2012. June 12th is a very eerie day. It's the same day OJ whacked those two people. And also <laughs> the the Pulse nightclub shooting was also June 12th. So oh, it's a wow. very, I'm a big numbers guy. So I'm always, okay. you know, I look at stuff and I'm always like, wow, 612, you know. So obviously every year I know when 612 is coming. So it was a regular day where I would be getting, I think my shift was, uh, uh, I think it was a, like a 9 to 7 p.m. Or okay. something like that. Might be nine to eight. We were like, no, actually nine to eight thirty. We're eleven and a half hour shifts. Ooh. So I was leaving at six o'clock to go play basketball. I put in being the senior guy on my shift, I would when the night, you know, crew would start coming on, I would just burn those two hours of vacation and go play basketball. I go, Well, I'm not gonna sit here and drive around in circles, you know. Sure. Uh, or get stuck with some freaking headache. So I put in the leave early to go play basketball. And I was one of 10 guys because we were very, real strict on having 10 versus nine because then you got to play half court versus full court. Ah, uh, okay. So I'm thinking, you know, it's about 4.30, like about an hour and a half till I punch out of here. I got my energy drink. I'm waiting <laughs> to go play hoops. And uh, Bolo goes out, you know, armed robbery at a bank in Del Rey, which is our neighboring city. Mm. And... I happen to be on US-1, which is one of the roads that connects us. You have 95, you know, and the turnpike's way out west. So it's, that's not even in our city. So the only real through streets besides neighborhoods is, you know, US-1 and obviously uh, 95. And most of the time they get out of Dodge. You don't find them, you know. I mean, unless you're right there or they got a die pack with a GPS or some shit. Right. You know? Which those are fun stories. They took that away because we were chasing them forever. And then... uh. <laughs> They took them away. The, the, I, those they, were awesome. Well, they started crashing and shit, and then the banks yeah. got sued, and then we get, you know how it is. Somebody <laughs> ruined the fun, you know. Darn so, it. So, anyways, a bullet goes out, you know, uh, blackmail robbed the bank with a gun, he had a mask on. Ha <laughs> ha, how funny. Things changed 10 years later. Yes, yes. And then uh, he left the, the um, scene in a red crown Vic with a white top. And that was the thing that stood out to me. Yeah, it's unusual. The bank at a red car. It looks like a pit right. mobile, right? Yeah. So, um, uh, turned out to be a Lincoln Town car, but it, you know, it matched similar. It was that same, same bubble look. Yeah. So, I remember uh, they dispatched on the bolo the two night guys in my zone, the, the Bravo units, to the call the bolo, and then I'm looking at myself. I'm the only available unit. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I, I know this is going to work. I'm going to get yep. that traffic crash or that domestic or DCF case, and I'm going to be stuck and not make basketball. Even though we looked out for each other. If I got stuck with some, they probably would have, hey, dude, I'll take it for you. I know you're getting out of here. Yeah. Um, that's how you have, you know, we had a good relationship with like that in our department. So I go, dispatch, put me on that call also. I'll be bowling. You know, I just hopped on the call myself. And I don't know if guys are familiar with that, but sometimes you're allowed to jump on a call and, you know, without permission, you know, it's right. cause you're just, we were very like if that. If you're close life. by, there's no reason why you shouldn't. Right. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember driving a couple of times on us one, not seeing much and over the bridge from the beach side, I saw a red car with a white top coming over the bridge and mm. we had a drawbridge in our city that would lead to the beach. And I saw it and I drove by, I peeked at it and I made a U-turn to come back because I knew he was going to be coming that way. And we stopped at the light. So now he's to my left. I'm facing south. He's about to go uh, at this westbound. And so I'm looking at him and I'm telling dispatch, yeah, I got a car here, red, you know, crown. It's a Lincoln Town Car, white top, black male driver. I couldn't see his face. All I could see is his hand on the steering wheel. And yeah. I remember his fingers tapping. <laughs> You know, and this is one of the details that comes up in therapy and stuff, all these minor things. Right. Because um, I never thought about it until I was going to get help for stuff. Sure. So 
he makes a right turn. So now he's going away from me. So I got to make a U-turn. And I actually have the audio of dispatch. I got all that stuff. That's the good thing about being in evidence. Um, <laughs> so he ends up going northbound at a pretty much high rate of speed. Not gunning it, but pretty swift. Yeah. So I make a U-turn. I let dispatch know, hey, he just kind of gunned it. I don't have a tag yet. I'm trying to catch up. No lights. I'm just kind of hustling it up a little bit, mm -hmm. you know. And he slows down. And it's, a, you know, it's a two lanes. And he's in the left lane. And I get behind him. And I, he's still driving. And all of a sudden, I see it's a handicap tag. Dispatch, handicap tag, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, he stopped right there in the middle of the road. I didn't light him up. Okay. He just stopped. So I'm like, man, handicap tag? Or is this some old timer coming from the beach? That's why he sped. He was erratic. Is he in diabetic shock? Diabetic coma? Right. Is he yep. drunk? I've had that. That, yeah. It doesn't necessarily make it my bad guy. Because how many times have we chased the wrong guy? Oh, right. So all day long. All that's playing in my mind. And maybe being a little more seasoned and seeing some different things throughout my career, I didn't rush it. You know, and that's one of the things I try to tell guys that I took my time. There was no reason to rush it. He didn't jump out, start shooting at me or anything. Right. We just stopped. So I turned my rear lights on. You know, it's almost five o'clock. You know, it's five o'clock traffic's coming just to let cars know I got a car stop and letting dispatch know he stopped right here and we're sitting there. And I look up, my camera's not on, my dash cam. Okay. What the heck? I had an older car. Sometimes the wiring itself would get loose. This right, is that transition right. time. If, we were still using VHS tapes. Yep. Okay. Yep. And I don't even know they had the flash cards in there yet at this time. No body cam. So the only camera yeah. you had was my dash cam. So I remember glancing up and it was off. And I was like, oh, I used to do that. If I turn my car off, sometimes I'd turn it back on. It would short it out and reboot. Mm. So I remember reaching up, turning it on. And luckily, that ends up showing the shooting later on. Who would have thought? But because yeah. you're so paranoid about getting in trouble for not having your damn Absolutely. camera in yes. my subconscious. That's what's so screwed up about it. I should be focused on this guy. So glance up, turn the camera on. We're sitting there. And then all of a sudden, he punches it. Takes off. Like, like, the, like the movies. So now I'm behind. Oh, I'm like, this That's an adrenaline dump. Yeah, good. And I'm like, oh, I think I got my bank robber. So yep. all of a sudden, we accelerated. And I caught another one one time with another officer, a couple of motorcycle bank robbers that, you know, this was a young rookie and they dumped their bikes and we had caught one guy running. And it was, I was like, yeah, I caught a bank robber. Cause that's like what you saw growing up, right? Cops. And Absolutely. Robbers. So that was like a huge thing. So here I am now in this chase and he starts to uh, run some red lights. He's kind of bumping cars as he's going through the intersections to squeeze through the turning lanes, that kind of shit. Go through an old parking lot. I'm, I don't know. Chris is behind me, Officer Monroe. He was our DUI guy. He actually was at the city pumps getting gas when the okay. call went out. And the closest unit that backed me up when the car first stopped was probably several minutes or a minute or two away, maybe, maybe 60 seconds. So he jumped on the call. So he gets behind me. Now we're both chasing him, you know, only maybe about two minute car chase, maybe three minutes. I, I never really timed it. And he ends up going down this road called Railroad Avenue, which is near a railroad track. And it's an industrial area, you know, mechanic shops and warehouses. And and I'm like, wow, he took this turn. I mean, nobody knows about railroad, how it connects uh, to MLK, which connects the Seacrest to 95. So that's the way I'm already planning out his moves. Or he's going to bail. He's a local guy. And sure. now we're going to be on a foot chase. All that, you know, that's what people forget. I'm still in a car chase and all this shit's going through my mind, you know, boom, boom, right. boom. This is what this job does to you. You know, this is why it causes so many heart attacks on us later on. So he's speeding, you know, we're calling it out. He goes through a stop sign. I'm tapping the brakes because I got to still make sure the stop sign's right. clear, you know, and he ends up taking a sharp turn and he cut the angle so much that he hit the car that was coming the other way. So there's a car stopped and he just kind of, bam. So they both lift up. Wow. I'm like, oh, okay. shit. So now I'm not in a very good tactical spot because I kind of rolled up on him because I didn't expect him to have a sudden stop. So now sure. throw it in park, open my door, undo the seatbelt. I remember everything was pretty smooth. Get, get, it, get out of the fucking seatbelt. Right. And got the gun out as I'm exiting my car door. And this is where everything just gets that slow motion shit you hear about. Yeah. Um, I see his door wiggling open. And you see it on my video. Um. It's wiggling. Oh, yeah. By then, the camera kicked on and started recording. So okay, at least we caught that thing. part of the chase. Yeah. <laughs> and the door's wiggling. And then all, and all of a sudden, it was like, pop, 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 pop. I started seeing the muzzle flash, right? And I'm like, holy shit, this motherfucker's shooting. And I'm, I got my gun out. And I don't remember exactly what happened from the point, point of being behind my door 
to moving to my left because he's shooting. I'm trying to get away from the threat. And subconsciously, I think yeah. by him not being able to open his door, I'm trying to get to where he can't get me. So I moved to the left. There was a telephone pole there. I'm laying rounds down. He's trying to shoot me and Chris back and forth. So he's, Chris, yeah, in case, you know, this is, if you're just listening on audio, he's almost has his hand like behind him over his shoulder shooting at you. Right. Correct? Almost. I'm a little bit to his like, you know, if you were to open your door partially and you could still cut the pie and see me, yeah. that's where he got me. Monroe, he couldn't. He was just shooting blindly. By then, Monroe's shooting. Uh -huh. I'm shooting. And then Monroe ends up coming next to me and we start laying more rounds down. And at that point on the video, you'll see another officer start coming like he's going to cover the back of the car and he gets pulled out of the way. Everyone always thinks that's me. <laughs> I never got pulled out of the way. That poor cop actually had a, a ride along with him and he was the third car pulled up and she's <laughs> yes. like some criminal justice major. <laughs> oh going, boy. Oh my God. Yeah. You're getting there freaking. <laughs> that's a <you> ride along. <laughs> oh my God. She could write a book probably on that whole shift. Yeah. Then, so he gets pulled back. And at that point, Monroe and I are still screaming commands to him. We can see him moving a little bit. Yeah. And we don't know at this time, but he had a stovepipe. And what people don't know, that's when you get a you know, your shell casing gets jammed in your um on the release of the slide, you know, it gets jammed up. Yeah, there. it's a it's a malfunction. So yeah, gun doesn't go boom. So he was trying to clear it or mess with it when we yeah. approached the window, and that's the point where the cop gets pulled back. You'll see me, I'm the only cop wearing shorts and uh you know, I'm bikes bicycle unit Heck guy, yeah. so Absolutely. still holding on to it, right? And you'll see me firing about three or four rounds through the window. And that's okay. pretty much when it ended the threat because he was still messing around with shit. And we backed away. And that's when everything starts. You start hearing the sirens going because sure. no one turned my, I didn't turn my siren off. Things were going so fast. And then I start feeling the pain in my foot. And I'm like, ah, man, what was that? And I look down, I see three holes through my shoe. So it went oh. long ways, just missing my big toe, but hitting the inside of that. And just pretty much, you know, like a drill right through the foot. Wow. Long ways, though. So now I'm starting to feel the pain and you hear the radio traffic and then someone's like, you're all right. And I go, I think I got hit. And they're like, oh, shit, you got hit in the foot. You know, so they take my shoe off. I'm seeing the blood. And then I'm seeing the other gunshot wound off the right side of my shin. It was just a grace, luckily. I mean, if it would have hit the shin bone, it would have shattered my shin. I probably would have fallen right at that point because I wouldn't have right. had any mechanical use of it. So yeah. by just it being muscle and tissue, I was able to stay in the fight because of the adrenaline. So next thing you know, you know, they're like dealing with the bad guy. You know, I don't know what's happened to him. I mean, sure. I kind of know, but I don't know, you know. And you had read in the show notes about you can't stop talking. Oh my God. I was like a canary dude. I was like, Oh my God. I didn't think that was a bank robber. And meanwhile, um, gold fuss was, uh, he was, he was one of the Bravo unit guys, but he's also a, a rep for the PVA. So okay. he's like, he's like stop up. talking. Shut they up. shut yep. the radio off and stuff. And you had mentioned he did ride in the ambulance with me. Okay. Um, he was there and he was trying to shut me up. He kept, cause I'm telling the paramedic, I'm like, what happened to the bank? guy and he's like oh he's dead i'm like yeah I'm like I'm like damn i guess i killed him and he's like and he's like dude just stop fucking talking you know yeah and, and you know like you said dehydrated i wanted to drink that ambulance water and the guy was like no you don't want to touch that stuff we don't know how long it's, it's probably just city tap water that they poured in and, right. and i remember the ac unit spitting out because it was june hot as hell down there and i'm like man i heard about guys getting like helicopter rides and all this crazy i'm cracking jokes you know like i'm on stage and meanwhile gold was like shut up dude so we get to the hospital and before we get there, actually, I did make two phone calls, which is weird. First call is my wife, of course. I was like, hey. Oh, yeah. You know. um, oh. Damn. That's okay. Which what? was you hilarious because we had a, my son was five months old. So oh, God. I'm calling her and I hear him crying. And I'm, and I'm like, hey, baby, uh, there's a little incident. You know, I got just a little one, just a little one. Yeah. I don't want a car to go into her driveway and scare the fuck out of her, you know? So, right. I was like, I got nicked in the foot. I'm going to go get some stitches at the hospital. And she was like, okay. Meanwhile, Killian's like, wow, you know? And she's like, okay. I'm like, all right, baby, love you. Bye. I'm like, okay, that's done. You know, she ain't going to have, I'll deal with that later. I got called my mom too, but that was another call at the hospital. And then I'm like, oh shit, I'm supposed to play basketball. So I called my buddy, Mike. <laughs> he's to this day. He's always like, why are you calling me? I go, dude, I'm not making hoops. He's like, oh, you're 10. That means we got to play half court. 
My guy just got shot, dude. I'm on my way to the hospital. And he's like, why are you calling me? Yeah. <laughs> I go, because I wanted credit. I didn't want to be credit. I was a true sellout, right? So that was well, funny. He, he brings it up to this day. I go, he, I go. he's like, I'm honored I got the second call. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, let me, let me stop you there. Okay. Let me ask. You know, the bad guy car collides with another car. Right. What happened to the person inside the bad, the person that he hit? I mean, they, she, they got a front row stage seat. To, she like, was some, some crazy stuff. She was some poor old lady um, that was just driving probably from church or something and just got oh. caught up in it. But luckily, none of our rounds, we fired over, I think it was around 38 rounds. We fired mm. into that car and none of the rounds hit her car. So at least we could say our training and experience were able yes. to at least hit the car. One of my rounds did hit the house behind the car because I think that's when I was initially running and just almost doing suppression fire for a second. Sure. Like, you know, just get off of me. Oh, yeah. I forgot to tell you, one of the craziest things was I, you know, I did range shooting. I, I was pretty good with a gun, but I wasn't your typical guy where I got guns everywhere. I shot all the time. I counted yeah. rounds. I wasn't that guy. I grew up around guns. I mean, my, it was not a big deal to me. You know, it was a useful tool the way I looked at it. So I never had this. I mean, I always respected it. Don't get me wrong, but I just didn't have this like love for it the way other sure. guys. Did. So when I was shooting, I remember something saying, dude, you're about to run out. And right then slide went back, transition reloaded. Probably one of my best I've ever had. You know, everything wow. was just focused. And I remember all this. I was like, man, what made me? all the training of course and shooting at the range and dry fire, you know, shooting until you dry fired and stuff like that. Yep. Learning that timing from shooting. So if anything, at least those qualifications that we did and some of the other additional training that was thrown in there at that moment, it got me to at least know how long before I run out of bullets. You know, luckily I wasn't at that point getting fired upon. He was still messing with his stuff, but yeah, it was by far the smoothest transition and so focused at that point and being able to count almost mentally was pretty cool and especially not being a guy that counted rounds you know yeah that's i find that interesting because you know i was the incident commander for seven different officer involved shootings where a cop shot and had to kill somebody and the last two i was like one or two blocks away you know obviously i heard it you know right. pop off and every time i I'd get there. Obviously, it's like, okay, you got to make sure the scene is safe. You know, you're, you're rendering aid to whoever is injured, bad and good. And, you know, later on, I've got the officer with me in the, my car. I'm a supervisor. And I'm like, how many uh, rounds do you think you fired? And it was always like, I don't know, two or three. Their magazine was like one from being empty. So it was like 16, 17. But yeah. you're not thinking that, you know, it's like, what pisses me off is like the media, et cetera, is like, oh, they didn't have to shoot him so many times. And it's like the officer at that point in time isn't thinking, gee, I'm just going to pump as many rounds as possible. And it's like, no, you fear for your safety. You're fearing for your life. You know, you're going to shoot until the threat is stopped. And, you know, I remember when I was at the range, when I was a recruit in the academy, you know, they're like, we want to show you how fast you can shoot. And it's like, okay. So it's like, okay, we're going to time you. We could get through about 15 rounds. Back then we had the Glock um, 40 cals. Mm -hmm. And we could shoot, you know, 15 rounds in under three seconds. And, you know, it's like now that's without adrenaline. That's right. without, it's like, holy shit, this guy is trying to kill me. I better do something about that. You know, and so you factor all that in. Then there's force multipliers. You had a partner that came up, you know, and was involved in it with you. So it's not 15 rounds, it's 30 rounds. Right. You know, so that's that's what gets under my skin. That's what pisses me off so much about, you know, popular, you know, pop culture or you know, the media trying to portray the police, you know, these big bad, you know, bad guys, you know, they didn't have to shoot them 30 times, they didn't have to shoot them 40 times. And I'm like, it's very, very explainable. Yeah, I was sitting there in a boot that night after the hospital. And I, one of my thoughts was, are we going to be indicted because we shot too much? Like, it yeah, just, it was a passing thought. And I'm like, wait, that dude shot me. <laughs> you know? <it's> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, and you just, you never know. I mean, here's an example. One of my buddies, he's working seven at night till three in the morning. They stop a car. The guy jumps out with an AK-47. 
and he starts shooting blindly at my buddy shoots him in the foot. That's where, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, foot and, but it blows a part of his foot off. So right. he's, he's on the ground immediately. His partner shoots this guy from 15 feet away in the back of the head as he's running away. Wow. And the bullet careened off his skull, knocked him out. He got a bad concussion, but it never penetrated a 40 caliber bullet from 15 feet away. It was just the angle. Yeah. You know, I've you, seen that. it's you know, just when you think you've seen it all. It was like, well, yeah, well, of course that's, you know, typical. There's nothing typical about this. There's nothing. I mean, every shooting is very unique. Every, every situation is unique and it's, yeah, you can't go jump into conclusions and I'm just happy that you guys made it out. Okay. Yeah. And we got a bad guy and, you know, we ended up being cleared. Everything was fine, you know, and, and then, you know, the, the other stuff happens over the years, you know, from that incident. So, oh yeah. you know, like what you were saying before, I mean, I've had officers that couldn't stop talking and that was you. Then I'd have the stoic guys and gals. I had one female that shot and killed somebody and, you know, either it's bawling stoicism, you know, just quiet as a mouse or just, they can't stop talking. You know, it's like, this is what happens. Our job, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, take a breath. It's okay. I said, you know what? You're going to tell your story to a bunch of people. You you don't need to tell me. I and mean, are you okay? And you're like, like I don't want to be in the, in the IA. Well, you know, <laughs> with that, you know, I wound up testifying in my first officer involved shooting where an off duty copper shot and killed somebody. And I had to testify in the uh, coroner inquest. Okay. And it didn't turn out well at all, but I told the truth. And, you know, it, it wasn't fun. It, you know, it's it goes against your grain. Yeah. You know, it's like, but I had to tell the truth. And it was it was messy. And unfortunately, that officer, the DA decided to issue charges of homicide, and he wound up killing himself before he even went to court. Mm. So, yeah, it's just some of the baggage you walk around with is like, God, I hope I had nothing to do with that. But I I had to tell the truth. Yeah, I've often thought I should, not that I'm a writer like you guys or anything like that, but writing a book called Law and Disorder and just going through everything that happened in my department because we had everything you're talking about, indictments, suicide, sex scandals, oh. vacation oh, yeah. vacation gates when all of a sudden guys had thousands of hours of vacation, <laughs> but yet they're taking trips all the time. Wait, what's going on here? <laughs> we had all that stuff, man. We had, we had one cop get run over by a bad guy that... They thought he was dead, and then all the cops chase the bad guy down and give him a beat down, and the passengers, and then the helicopter caught it. So then it turns out the Justice Department ended up indicting our cops for wow. civil rights violations. So I, I saw that in the things, too. So. Yep, seen all, the, all of the above. Yes, that and more. But um, so for those who don't understand or are in the know, when you know you are forced to take a life, you're involved in a shooting like that. What does the investigation look like on your end? Or what, what was your department? What, how did they handle that? I remember thinking it was weird because they did a walkthrough with Chris because I was in the, at the hospital. So right. I guess they filmed it and he's going over with the uh, state attorney's office that's doing the investigation. And our department mirrors it. So I, they ended up talking to me like two days later. I went in the our D Bureau conference room or interview room and yeah. told my story, you know. And that was pretty much it. Um, my my issue was kind of like the after effect. You know, I remember me and Chris, or Chris and I were both in. Uh, we saw the psychologist at the same time, just one time, you know, and it was right after I got shot. So I was Mr. Chatty. I'm like, no, I'm great, man. Right. This is, man, I'm so glad I won the Super Bowl, you know, and police work, you know, killed a bank robber, got shot. And, you know, I did it all in one, you know, and <laughs> I'm fine. You know, yeah. and Chris was like, I'm fine, too. You know, and then six months later, Chris gets on another shooting. And, you know, on a, and it was one of those where the bullet goes around the guy's skull and doesn't go through the head. You know? Okay. And just, uh, yep. And just like you were saying, I'm like, yeah, I saw that. So anyways, yeah, that was happening. So, yeah, it was uh, like for for us, it was a two stage investigation. When I was a younger cop earlier on in my career, our homicide unit would investigate. Then there was a state law that was passed where an outside agency who had to do the investigation. Is that what happened with you? I, it's pretty much set up that the state attorney's office sets okay. up 
they have their own sworn cops that come in. They're usually former cops around the area. Right, anyway, so right. you know them. They come in, they talk to him, they talk to me. They have my videotape. You know, Chris's in-car camera, even though it was a DUI guy, the way he had pulled up on the crash was angled away mm. from the scene. So the only thing his video shows is the bushes with all the rounds. Okay. You know, and it's a, almost a two-minute shooting. And it's a pretty long time. That's a long time. Yep. It so sure is. It was good. My video was there. Anyways, yeah, it was that. And then I remember one of the deep bureau guys going, Eric, we got the video. And I was like, oh, I still want to see it. You know, and he's like, I can't release it yet. He's like, but you're good. You know, it has him okay. pulling the gun, shooting at you guys. So I was like, OK, whew, I feel good. You know? Yeah, because what people sometimes don't understand, there's a criminal investigation because, you know, there is a, a homicide. It's justifiable, but it's they have to investigate that. Then once the DA or whoever the prosecuting agency is says, you know, yeah, this is justifiable, you know, case closed. Then like where I work, then the internal affairs investigation pops up. They want to make sure you did everything within policy, et cetera, et cetera. And it used to be you get interviewed by like three or four different people and you couldn't go home until you were interviewed by all those people. So it was completely inhumane towards the cop that was right. just in this situation and thank God they realize it's like, okay, that's not cool. And why can't we have like these three or four entities interview this poor guy one time, you know, instead yeah. of him getting three or four separate interviews. And it takes time. You got to, I was lucky enough because I haven't, I mean, the foot injury, I had an open workers comp claim going, sure. I ended up having a surgery again in 2014, you know, I've, um, so there was always constant. So when I went to seek help for PTSD issues, I was at least able to piggyback off of that and then fight like hell with the workers comp people. You know, they made me cry oh. in the boardroom with all their lawyers picking and probing on me and finally got the help I needed in 2015. And that's when Dr. Barnett was like, Eric, you're going to have to learn how to dance with this because it was it, this is affecting your central nervous system. There's a lot of sure. stuff that's going on behind the scenes that you got to understand. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me, seeking that therapy and understanding why I was feeling the way I was feeling, the hypervigilance, all that stuff that we all go through on a normal basis. Now, you know, from an event like that, it's even crazier. You know? So how long after that incident were you cleared to be back on the street? Oh, we were cleared by the state attorney's office let's see, yeah, within a month or oh. maybe less than that. It was, but okay. I wasn't back clear for duty and for about three months and then you know okay. after the rehab i went back to the road and that's when i noticed whoa this job's a little different now you know it's not like quite can you give us any examples of like how that changed you know your policing and it was what that, what that looked you always like? you always had the uh you know you're trained to you know to anticipate all the time you know think outside the box whether you're looking at you know every call you know, I I read those FBI studies of all the cops that have been killed, and I, I want to know what, what happened, you know. And sometimes it's just out of the cop's control, nothing you can do. He's sitting at a light or whatever, and some guy just, you know, ends his day or whatever. And then there's other circumstances where they, you know, there's a shoplifter, and he's like, oh, it's just a shoplifter. Meanwhile, the guy's wanted for other stuff. So there's right. all that. So every call was kind of anticipating being in some life or death situation. More That's than a usual. lot of stress, man. Oh, yeah, it was building. And I even had a couple of calls. And there was one guy, a shoplifter from Walmart. He's riding away, get away on his bicycle, and he passes me the other way. And they're like, <laughs> there he goes. So I had to turn around. And then he dipped inside this apartment complex. And I'm seeing him go by the little openings of the stairway. Like, there he goes, there he yeah. goes, there he goes. So we had him locked in. And then um, I remember getting out walking and just read FBI study about shoplifter killing a cop. So I got my gun out now, you know, Absolutely. I, to tell you, I, I don't know who this cat is. Right. And I remember coming around the corner, seeing his bike. Oh, he's close now. Or maybe he lives there. I don't know. Right. And I came around the corner and he was blading against the wall, trying to blend in. Mm. And I gave him verbal commands. He came out, you know, like get on the ground and he reached in his freaking pockets, dude. And I fucking got, I ran on him and threw him to the ground and then got his hands out and I handcuffed him and I was so jacked up again, Mr. Chatty. And I was like, dude, what the hell are you doing? I almost shot you. And he's like, I was just getting my ID officer. I've never had a gun pointed at me before. So this wow. guy in his moment of crisis thought, Oh, cops there. I got to get my ID ready. He's going to want it, mm. you know? And he was just a guy in rehab from some other state down in Florida, down on his luck, whatever. Not that it, 
didn't mean I would have been, you know, cleared. Right. But that effect, I'm like, man, I almost shot that dude. You know? Wow. And I would have, you know, I would have had to take that one with me too. You know, shooting an unarmed guy and all that. Oh yeah, you're fine. He reaches whatever. I still got to live with it, right? So yes, that started weighing down on me. And then of course I got to calm myself down. So the drinking at night when I get off shift was increasing. You know, with that bad, you know, bad habits of eating, and it's this cycle of you know isolation and then keeping my family in tight. Don't want them to go nowhere. Now, you know, were, were you them married all. at the time? You you were married and you had one child, right? Yeah, and I had a second child in 2015. Okay. So he so came along. How did that affect your family life? Oh, uh, I would say if you talk to them, it affected them a lot, especially my, um, you know, when you, the PTSD side of the no patience anymore to yeah. being very edgy, flipping off the handle at little things sometimes, and then going back to the cycle of apologizing and doing all that. You know, I, I could I could see that stuff going on. And my kids, you know, they were young. They screamed, you know, all that stuff was just, ah, I couldn't take the noises and the slamming of hammers and mm. all that stuff was just like beating my brain down. But luckily, you know, like I said, I went and saw the doctor and started talking about it. And I know they stuff to this day, there's stuff there from that and the way I've behaved. And especially, you know, obviously the way you handle something, if you got a couple of drinks in you is different than yes. when you don't. Absolutely. So, now, how as far as the drinking goes about how much were you drinking? Like at the worst point, I would go, I mean, it wasn't, uh, if I had to put it in the beers, let's say six pack a night, something like that. Okay. Weekend football, big basketball, but you know, Hey, I'll, I may drink a 12 pack, you know, mm. or have a heavy buzz through the weekend, you know, and now, all looking back, you know, now that I've been sober, I look back and it was just, I was just trying to escape a lot of it, you know, just like typical, like anybody else. Now did your wife or like, close friends did they try pulling you off to the side and say you know eric you know things aren't going right here for you you know maybe you should get some help i hit it pretty well my wife wasn't talking to anybody else about it. it's not like she called my mom and said hey you know you need right. to talk to eric i mean it it was getting to the point where that may have probably happened but i never you know i wasn't um, physically abusive at least maybe verbally i may have said some things were a little bit too sharp sure you know and but she was like, you're changing. Something's going on. And I was feeling the stress of work. And, you know, she's a stay at home mom um, busting her ass with those kids. Right. And now doing details. Now I'm even, you know, I'm working extra money to, to you know, and here I am that uniform all the time, dude. You know, even my off days wearing the uniform, working at the library, working at a fair, you know, okay. it's just constantly boom 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 you know and realizing now how unhealthy that was but at the time i didn't it was just part of hey this is what cops do you were in some shit you know we got honored in washington dc we were you know we got to up there for the you know police memorial yeah and experienced that we were up there with the uh, cops that caught the boston bombers so it was Ooh. this all-star cast of us and we were february of 2013 and they were whatever the month that was yeah and it was just awesome to talk to those guys and I talked to a cop from like another state that was there because he saved some kid drowning. A couple of them didn't save people. They tried. They did some heroic stuff and the people yeah. didn't make it. Mike, it was just uh, what an experience that was. But with it came survivor's guilt. You know, then every time you hear about a death of a cop, especially you go into their life a lot deeper than I did before. Oh, he's a father mm -hmm. too. Oh, that sucks. Those poor kids. Well, instead, wow, what are those kids going to do now? You know, mm -hmm. their dad's not around. It would start playing, you yeah. know, and it would get me down those deeper, you know, places, I guess, wasn't healthy. Yeah. And I was lucky enough not to get so depressed that I ever considered suicide or anything like that. But if I didn't have my wife and kids and I didn't have maybe just some other good things in my life to keep yeah. me from going down that road, I could see how that could happen to somebody. I mean, it, I couldn't turn it off. Right. So did you hit like rock bottom and then it's like, okay, I got to change some stuff here. You know, there's got to be a change. I didn't know what to do before I was seeking help. What was happening was the wife's like, Hey, you should probably cut the drinking. You know, like, right. you know, all right. Yeah. Here she is <laughs> bitching again. And then well, I didn't know what to do. I don't have, you know, I don't have the skills or I don't have, I'm sorry, the education at that point of knowing what I need. I didn't know I was exercising. You know, that's good. Trying to trying to do that. Yeah. You know, I'm still drinking. I'm still not talking about it. I'm still not dealing with it. 
Mm-hmm. And then half the time, I didn't know what I was dealing with. You right. know, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. And looking back, a lot of it was the <clears throat> the uh, stress of the event, going into that primal state, sure. taking a life, and then the awards afterwards, feeling guilty for it. You know, so many things that you were just overwhelmed at times. But I never went to a spot where I was sitting in the car with my gun to my mouth. I oh, never okay. got that far. Um, Thank God. I reached out to one of my, uh, he's now a chief of police in uh, New Mexico. I reached, I walked in his office and I broke down. I was like, I don't know what's going on. And I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. So, um, and he goes, oh, you got to go. He was in a critical incident. So, okay. I was able to relate. He was able to relate to me. And I was like, this is what's going on. He's like, yeah, I'm going to do the same shit. You got to go to EAP first to start. So I went to that stupid thing that oh, EAP, what are they going to do? I broke the ice with that. Talked to the therapist that there. And she's like, yeah, you do need to talk to somebody. And I was like, okay, now what I do, you know, and luckily I had the workers comp case open. So I was able sure. to piggyback off that. But if I was a regular cop and I didn't get shot, like Chris, he didn't have an open workers comp. What does that guy do? Right. right. Does he go to HR? Does he tell his, his road sergeant that's going to tell everybody else, you know, or have to do some for, you know, policy, yeah. you know? So then you're like, well, shit. You know, I always felt bad for those guys that didn't have something to piggyback off of, you know? And so anyways, that's how I, I started. And then, you know, I was able to go to that hearing with workers comp mm. to where I was able to go to their independent therapist. And sure. then they said, okay, this guy needs to talk to somebody and we'll split, you know, we'll cover the bill. All right. So then now I saw it- that. So I'm saying, I was going to say, I saw that doctor for two weeks, every two weeks for the last, what, four years of my career. Excellent. Well, so that, you, that's what did it. At my agency, unfortunately, you know, critical incidents are just, it's the cost of doing business. You know, the, the yeah. bigger the department, the more it's going to happen. And there's a very informal group of them that have been in situations like you and they get together and they're their own little community. We have a, a chaplain who was a police officer and he was involved in a critical incident. So he, yeah. he's not blowing smoke up your skirt. He, he's walked the walk and we have two police psychologists speak. And it was all, you know, we were much more reactive than proactive as any, most police departments, you know, we had, right. we didn't react until we had four or five police suicides, like within okay. four years. And it's like, okay, Houston, we got a big problem here. We got to take, so you got to have the right people. The chaplain, spot on. George Papakristo, love the guy. He's, yeah, he is a rock star. We have yeah. two police psychologists. One is married to a cop, and the other one, her dad was a Milwaukee cop for 30 years. Yeah, so they're, they're deeply embedded into the whole culture and all that. Did you have any kind of resources like that? Only thing we did was there was a group of us that would talk to rookies, you know, maybe you got 10 rookies right out of Academy in service yeah. training stuff. And they would have a day where they brought in five or six of us that were in shootings or, you know, and all of us were different. You know, somebody got shot, somebody killed somebody, somebody lost right. their dog because of a shooting. And you got to hear their stories. You know, a lot of the guys got divorced after those yeah. incidences because they didn't talk about it or they started drinking too much so you started hearing that these stories telling them to the young rookie guys and i was like this is some of the most therapeutic shit i've ever done sitting yes. in these little groups talking oh absolutely <laughs> talking to other people who've gone through the same thing as you or similar things oh there's nothing better yeah so that's what and then we did that for a few years and you know new chief comes in training things change and that <laughs> is not a, it was non-existent okay. and i was like well shit i kind of like doing that so then obviously that's where it kind of you know segue you know but that's how the cops and campers thing got sure. started when i was having these similar conversations at campgrounds with different cops and that's how absolutely you know, that's where the gold that. is i think but you yeah. know so you're back on the road and how much time do you have left before you could retire what are you looking at uh in 2012 i thought i had to do a full 20 at that point so i thought 2022 was my retirement date so i still thought at 10 years and i'm like yeah. and then there's five years drop I'm like, that could be 15 years. Oh, boy. So, you know, I'm already, I'm like, I'm already 42. I'm going to be like almost six years old by the time I get out of here, you know? And meanwhile, I'm watching six-year-old cops, retired cops, drop a heart attacks all the time, oh, not yeah. knowing that my path in life would 
end up going that direction, you know, trying to help guys. So, so you um you were on the road and then you went into evidence. How many years you I finish out your career in evidence then, right? yeah, in twenty well, the, six months later, evidence posted. The reason we had a cop in evidence was we had civilians stealing. Okay. And that was a couple of years before. So they just went ahead and put two sworn positions in there because they wanted somebody trustworthy, right? So one of those uh, detect or um, officers in there got promoted to a detective mm. spot. So it was an opening and everybody would run the other way at evidence. Oh my God, I can't imagine everyone to do that. You know, and I ran with my arms wide open. I was like, you know what? Get me off the road. Let me take a break of this freaking nonsense of, you know, call the call, listen to the radio. Sure. I knew it would be a Monday to Friday or Monday through Friday job, eight hour <laughs> days. Yeah. Uh, it was just, it's what I needed at that time. The guy I worked with, Dan, he was fantastic. He was a, you know, former cop because he, he actually went to civilian status, but he was a former cop. So we got along great. And I learned so much about the backside of stuff from, you know, the DNA side and, you know, evidence submissions and taking stuff to labs and the deadlines and taking stuff to courthouses for trials. Sure. And next thing you know, I became involved in a lot of the stuff our department was doing behind the scenes, all the investigations, even our own cops investigations, you know, and I always thought it was weird. I'm like, yeah, I'm looking at my buddy's DNA in a rape case. And I'm like, there's probably <laughs> something wrong with this. I shouldn't be having, have access to this. You know? not. Yeah. I mean, he was at my Halloween party dressed up in a convict <laughs> uniform. So I mean, come on. he was acquitted. He was acquitted, but lost okay. his job. Good. Um, oh, I boy. guess, I guess sex on a hood of a police car is frowned upon. Anyways, <laughs> in so, certain circumstances, yes, yes, it is. Anyways, but yeah, I learned so much in evidence. Went to all kinds of schools. Really thought that that was going to be my direction when I retired. Get a civilian job at Asheville PD in North Carolina because I met a girl that worked at that PD, and I thought, man, what a great place to work in the mountains, you know? Yeah. So that's kind of what I was thinking about. I tried to max out my, you know, all my evidence knowledge because that's what I thought I'd do. You know, okay. So, how did your career end? In well, in <laughs> in twenty, we were part of an evidence move. Our department because they wanted to redo downtown, right? And that included our department. But our new department wasn't going to be ready for two years, so they decided to move us into a warehouse for two years. So we had to be part of an operation of where we made a full warehouse into a working police department including evidence we brought a storage tanker one of those ones you see on a ship that was our safe in the evidence room brought that in dropped it in you okay. know cameras temperature sensors for all the weed and the guns oh sure sure oh, man what a nightmare so i'm sitting there after we did the first move and i already got rid of thousands of evidence pieces of evidence because i purged like crazy they go eric you want some extra money work the weekend purging stuff and i'm like gladly and I'd put on rock and roll and be out you you know, just getting rid of cases. Boom, boom, boom. And I didn't want to do it again at the new PD, bring it all. you know. And I had found out at, um, at my department, somebody walked by one day and said, did you know you can retire at 50 years old? I was like, how's that? Because I'm 49 at this point. Okay. But like, if you've got over 15 years in, it says in our contract that you can retire after 15 years and start collecting your pension. I'm like, what? So I call HR, you know. And she's like, yep, yeah, you've got, you know, 18 and a half years in. You can retire on your 50, when, right when you turn 50. I go, so I can retire on my 50th birthday? And she goes, yeah. I go, sign me up. How do I retire my 50th birthday? I go, it's going to be the best 50-year-old 50, 50 birthday present ever. Yeah. And that was about, uh, about nine months out. And my wife and I sold our house. We moved into another property that we owned in the family. And rented, you know, kind of just paid the rent there, which, which is in the city of Boynton Beach, and decided, all right, we're going to retire and freaking buy an RV and travel the country, right? And I'm like, this lady's crazy, but heck, let's do it. You know, I can't stay down here in Palm Beach County unless I'm a cop because it's too expensive or I got to okay. get another job. I got to go back to work to pay the mortgage right. to stay in this environment. Sure. She's like, let's just go. You know, we'd already been through the shooting. She was like, um, uh, another thing I should go back to in 2018, 2017, I was actually at my heaviest. I was 250 pounds. Mm -hmm. A lot of my bad habits were still, I was still drinking, still eating bad, still highly stressed. My cortisol levels are crazy. So I went from probably the time of my shooting, I was 220 
I put on another 30 pounds mm. just in life and stress. And stress, yeah. So in 2018, a buddy of mine I played basketball with told me about the ketogenic way of eating, pretty much meat and vegetables, a little bit of fruit once in a while get off of breads and pastas. I was like, all right, I don't want to take medication. You know, I hate the doctors already in South Florida because I was part of the <laughs> opiate crisis. I saw all that misery. Sure. I mean, I was part of arresting doctors and pill mills and shit. So I was like, all right, let me try it. I lost 50 pounds in six months. I got down to 204 wow. pounds and I hadn't seen that since high school. Started helping cops. That's when the Keto 5 thing started. You know, mm -hmm. they called me Keto. And then it was, go see Keto 5 and evidence. <laughs> you know, guys were coming up to me thinking I was sick or something with cancer. Right. And I, no, dude, I'm sick with life. I'm figured out all that toxic shit messes you up everywhere. All your organs, your brains, everything. So I really dove into that. So I'm figuring I'm going to go do nutrition stuff. I'm going to help people. Yeah. That's going to be my new career. So retire 2019, sell the house. I get an email and that's, I don't know if you want to get into my brother, Dave, but this was like the cherry. Yeah, sure. Top. Why not? Yeah. What, what the heck? So, why not? 2019 that summer, I'm watching shows with my wife, like tree house shows. Let's live in a tree house. Let's <laughs> put a storage tanker in the woods and, you know, cut <laughs> holes in it. And I'm like, Oh my God. I just tiny wanna... houses. Yes. Yeah. Tiny houses. Oh my God. So that's happening. And then I get an email one day and it's, I had done 23 and me back in 2016. My mom's Cuban descent. And all her, let's say the North Carolina side of her family is all like Viking Irish from freaking back in the day, you know, Dublin and all that stuff. So my dad's side is the same stuff, Vikings and all this, you know, chaos where fighters and warriors <laughs> were and all this stuff. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. They got my DNA already. So I wasn't worried about them having it. Now that well, I was, I wasn't worried. Now I am. So the email comes up and says, Hey, uh, a relative wants to get in touch with you. I was like, ah, another cousin, another hundredth cousin or a fifth cousin. You know, we share a great grandfather or something. Right. And this one says right off the bat, it says, hi, my name is Dave Stull. I know very little about my family. I was adopted as a baby. Um, I recently did 23 and me cause my birth parent or my adopted parents are both gone. I know nothing about my genes. Yeah. Your health and, and anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it goes, and it came up that you're my half brother and not only that we're both <laughs> tops and we both live, and we both live in florida so now i'm like what cop what? what and so i remember being at 2j's having my eggs and avocado and bacon and showing my partner dan i go leave this and he's like dude you gotta call him i was like what and so i text him and the next thing you know we're facetime and i'm looking at this cat and he turns out to be my older brother by a year wow. and a half my dad had me uh i think around 19 so this is the 18 year old him okay. and and this dude looks more like my dad than any of the rest of us siblings right wow. so it's like crazy it's like looking at a younger version of my father and so turns out he's in Orlando, I'm sorry, an Orange County Sheriff's uh sergeant in Orange County, which is in Orlando. Damn. And he's sitting there working at the courthouse, running their takedown teams or some shit. And I'm like, so we start talking, and it's weird because you're talking to this 50-year-old guy that you never known, but he's your brother. You know, and we had like the same fingers and hands. Yeah. It's just weird, dude. How it's old were both of you when you discovered each other? I was 49, he was 50. He was wow. scheduled to retire in two years, and I was retiring that October. That is crazy. So I walked into my PIO office, which is public information yeah. officer for people that don't know. And I go, hey, um, I go, you want to hear a crazy story? I go, I did that DNA thing. And I go, you know, I came back. I got a cop brother in freaking Orlando two hours <laughs> away. And she's like, oh, what? She's like, oh, please, can we go to the press with this? And I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm like, all right, I guess. Let me ask Dave, though. He's my older brother, and I got to take orders from him. And <laughs> and, he's, and he's a boss. He's a sergeant also. So a double whammy on me. And I go, Dave, they want to go to the press with this. And he's like, I'm like, clear it with your people, because I don't know. I don't want to get us all jammed up. And, man, that shit went crazy. Caught on like wildfire. Next thing you know, we're on Fox and Friends in the morning doing a little interview. Damn. You know, I, I dropped the Baba Booey on there, because that's when I liked Howard. And then <laughs> I said some others and next thing you know we're on uh lester holt mbc Net nightly news we're at local newspapers local radio shows that we're on sirius xm talking on a you know a radio show on there and it was crazy and here i am coming up on my 50th birthday when i'm retiring and everything is just wow. like here i find this brother so dave and i dave and i start to get to know each other and he's been yeah. rving for 10 years 
So here is my guardian angel shows up. I don't know anything about towing. I've never been an RV or never been a camper. And this guy's been doing it 10 years. He's like, ah, we'll go camping. Let's rent an RV for you. We'll camp together. So I got to camp with my big brother, never camped before. He taught me all, you know, all this stuff. And he actually got me my thousand trails membership, which is where I was in New York when they tried to kick me out of the camp. Oh, off yeah, the flag. Yeah. So it's his fault that <laughs> that lot of bullshit Darn started. Him. So I guess he's part of this whole thing. But it, no, it was cool. I mean, talking today, I mean, he grew up in San Diego. He was adopted by a Navy helicopter pilot. Mm. And he grew up out there and his dad was the officer in charge out there at the at the base where Top Gun was filmed. Oh, is that cool? So he so he got to meet because his dad's, you know, the house on the hill. Yeah. Was uh back, you know, back behind the scenes. And he got to meet Tom Cruise and he was just like all involved in this Hollywood life scene oh, or is lifestyle. That cool? yeah. you know, like my mom saw him in, you know, homicides <laughs> in Florida. I go, I'm surviving at the YMCA with how many pedophiles? I can't even tell you. And then, you know, you're surfing, you know, wavy Davy, you know, surfing out there. But he ended up, his dad retired his senior year in high school. So Dave ended up back to West Virginia where his dad grew up. So here he is, a California boy in West Virginia. Oh, God. Culture shock. And yeah. he's like, well, let's go to Florida. So at 21, he went down there and applied to be a cop and got he started at 21. So I was 10 years behind him. OK. And he actually worked Hurricane Andrew when my mom was working it. So who knows that they maybe crossed paths and didn't do a quick stare at each other and kept walking, you know, yeah, or something. I, wonder, <laughs> I wonder if you or your mom, like sat next to him at an in-service or some training or something, just not knowing who he is, you know, my, my career actually did cross paths in my mom's career on one. T oh, one, okay. One fateful day. All right. I was in FTO first phase where you're right. You know, you just ride next to the person. Yeah. And it was a vandalism call alert tone, though, on a vandalism call, call someone breaking windows. So we're a couple blocks away. We start going. Another unit gets there, Officer Diaz, and he goes, this ain't no vandalism. This gunshot um, woman, several gunshot wounds, blah, blah, blah. So we pull up, and now I'm evidence guy, but I, I remember walking up to the window and seeing the smoke still coming out of this. It was a murder-suicide by our boyfriend. Mm. But... He didn't kill himself there. He drove all the way down to Opalaka in Miami, killed himself there. And that's where my mom's oh, unit responded. Okay. And I was like, holy cow. You know, it's <laughs> like my, my mom, fourth, <laughs> my fourth day in service. My mom's <laughs> career is crossing my, but yeah, that was, uh, but yeah, Dave and her, I don't know, officially, I, they never met till later on. Yeah. But yeah, I still had to call my dad. Say, like, Dad, where were you in the fall of 1967? He's like, what? <laughs> what am I Why are you asking? Yeah. <laughs> He's been married five times. I mean, you talk about being a divorced kid. I mean, I've got eight marriages with my two parents. Wow. So that's a whole talk show on itself. But, yeah. Um, so I had to call dad and go, dad, you're in fall of 1967. I knew he started in the Air Force in January of 68. Okay. So I knew and he graduated high school in June of 67. So I got six months. I got six months <laughs> to find out where you were. And he goes, I was in Pensacola. I'm like, really? Dave was born in Pensacola. I'm like, oh, Check. I knew it wasn't my mom's kid. I mean, it's just the way things have worked out. Right. So I finally got him that mid. He was working at like Zares or Woolworths or something. He was <laughs> kicking it with the girl in the lingerie department. <laughs> Typical, right? You know, retail, right. the guy in the paint department, girl in the lingerie. Sure. And they dated for a little bit. And she had told him she was pregnant. And he was like, well, I guess we got to get married. Yeah. And then later on, she came back. I don't know the time frame. Or maybe he left town. He says she came back, says she wasn't pregnant. And then they ended up not dating anymore. And he moved to Atlanta and then started selling encyclopedias and then went into the Air Force. And, you know, wow. already I knew my mom from previous times of going to the same high school. So they started kicking it when he was in the Air Force. And oh, OK. Anyways, Dave's mom was, I guess, going to be married to somebody else. So then she mm -hmm. put him up for adoption. And okay. that's pretty much was his story. He's since met her. He's since met our dad. He's met the whole family. He's gone from zero siblings to, I think, seven. Oh, shit. <laughs> and he's got like 16 nep nieces and nephews or something. So oh, we're like, my Dave, gosh. Dave's <laughs> retired sergeant. He's got money. Yeah. Yay. No, kid. <laughs> no kids. So he drives a big RV. You know, I always say the ones with the big RV, they were the bosses. They were their chiefs, majors, <laughs> lieutenants. All those other guys are doing the tow along, you know. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, so Dave has just been, he could be a movie in himself, man, with what's happened with that guy and then what he's been for me and just his story alone. I mean, it's been yeah. insane. And, you know, 
he's more reserved. He's quieter. You know, I mean, we got approached by the amazing race. They sent us audition information. Okay. So we filled it out and we were actually flying out there 2019 to LA for casting for the amazing race. They're going to have these two guys yeah. that don't know each other. Long lost brothers. Yeah. Trying to freaking get along. And we're already, I'm like, I'm not jumping out of no plane. He's like, well, I'm not singing. I go, well, I'll try <laughs> singing, but I'm not jumping out of no plane. And you know, how the show works. They'll have me jump out of a plane and have him sing. So right. you know, I'm trying to, and then, you know, they pushed us back to February. So we're like, okay, you know, not a big deal. And then COVID hit. And then, they were flipping police cars and burning cars. So I told Dave, I go, I think that ship is yeah. gone. That thing burned yep. down in the ocean. Sure but at is. that same time, when Dave and I and all this craziness is going on, that's when Doug Myro of Narcos, he's one of the producers, reached out to me at my department and said, hey, man, do you know the Narcos series? I go, man, I'm watching Mexican Narcos right now. Yeah. I love all that stuff. And he's like, well, and I'm like, oh, they want me and Dave in a movie. This is going to be great. <laughs> They're like, we want to talk to your mom. Oh, Oh, I want to talk to my mom again. Her, you know, so ended up getting them in touch with my mom. And, you know, they got in touch with that. You know, she's married to Al from the show. So it's like they flew out to him, him and Eric, and they got all their freaking stories down. And they were like, we're going to start. We're going to like do some type of Miami Narcos show with Griselda or something. And I was like, oh, that'll be cool. Sure. And then we didn't hear anything because COVID hit. Uh-huh. You know, and then about a year and a half later, I get a call and my mom's like, hey, there's an actress named Juliana Martinez that's playing me. She wants to talk to you. <laughs> oh, uh, wow. So now I'm on the phone with Juliana, who's an awesome girl. She's from Hialeah. She went to, I think, Harvard and got her acting stuff out in L.A. Mm. But she was asking me all the stuff about tossing my room, room <laughs> raids. My mom was looking <laughs> for stuff. And what did, how did my mom be a cop so it was kind of funny to watch that in the show the interaction and the one scene that they have me in there when i'm going to baseball practice and i'm telling about my mom leaving her gun in the glove box um that scene where she's like i get it eric like if she got real sharp with me i was yeah. like Woo, i could feel it to my bones like she nailed it on that scene because my mom was ruthless <laughs> if i was getting under her skin like she had ah. enough shit going on and here i am complaining about something so it was like so that was a real cool part of that, you know, whole story too of 2019. So you asked about what retired. I lost, ended up losing 80 pounds overall, curing my heart disease. I mean, you're never cured, but I, you know, right. calmed it down, found a brother. My mom got this Narcos Netflix show. We sold our house, got a, a trailer. We're traveling the country and I got my sports nutrition license. So I'm like, I'm going to put my flag up in campgrounds and meet all these first responders and help them with metabolic health because I did it. I'm a walking example. And then we go to New York and that's why I tell me leave the campground with my flag. And then that started a whole nother freaking shit storm. Yeah, you know? that it's on YouTube. <laughs> I watched it. You know, that, you know, if, for our listeners here, you know, if you want to check it out, I'll put it in the show notes. And there's a uh, about a 30 minute documentary with you in it about yeah. you. Yeah, I watched that as well. That was. Yeah, wonderful. that was that turned out to be a really I mean, this at that particular time. I did lose my cool with that guy. I didn't beat his ass like I wanted to do, but you know, he was telling me down, t- telling me to take down the thin blue line flag that was pretty much part of my family and my history. I mean, I got dead cops on my arms and stuff. So I was like really offended by it. And for me to get that angry and to go in the red that much, I, you know, that was bringing back more of that. Sure. Ooh, I don't like being in that zone. I'm not comfortable there. I'm out of control. And there's a lot more you didn't see. I mean, I went back into the camper when he was calling his manager. And then I came back, you know, like a, a scene where you finally got to calm down. Yeah. And then the guy comes back out. And another thing. You oh. Motherfucker. Oh, that was me. I came back out yelling at that guy, <laughs> threatening him. I go, you touch that flag and see what happens to you. Like, I lost it. Oh, manager man. comes over. I lost it some more. Ended up keeping the flag in my truck for the night to sleep on it and all this feedback, social media, because I put out the video sure. and it was like, fuck that campground or fucking, you know, uh, crying cop. He can't fly his flag. You know, all that crap was. Going uh, on. Sure. So I was getting it everywhere. Yeah. And law enforcement today did a little news article on it in their online paper. And then um, Channel 12 blaze gomez came out and did a news story on it okay and that stirred up all this traffic so thousand trails is getting memberships canceled because they won't do a press release on their beliefs are like what's their flag policy do they like flags do they know flag you know because at the time they had canadian flags up 
every other decorative flag you can think of. Sure. They just target in our thin blue line flag, the one that's right behind you. That's so right. I was like, I lost it. So then I thought, you know, we got eight days here. I'm going to stay here for all eight days and be an irritant. So I put everything police I had in the trailer <laughs> outside. We started having cops pull up that were hearing about it. So then it started, okay. I'm starting to meet more cops. They're like, keep with the fight, brother. You know, and then Thousand Trails, the camping club, suspended me for two months for being belligerent to staff because I put the video out there so they could see it. Right. And then uh, all these campgrounds, and once I put that out there, all in upstate New York, four of them said, hey, Eric, bring your flag, your rig, and your family. You're staying with us. And we went out there, and every campground I went to, I was meeting local cops, local cop supporters, all this craziness. And challenge coins and you know it was awesome sure. so then we get back to niagara falls because we're still traveling it was 2021 yeah. it's a year you know the chaos i'm in new york where my skin crawls already and it's just because my wife's from new york so we had to do a couple <laughs> things there so we're in niagara falls and i get an update on twitter now i'm starting to get more involved in social media i'm not trying to be but uh oh all this stuff's coming right. my way and they're like, they're having a rally for you at the campground next weekend. I'm like, I'm in Niagara Falls, like five hours away. And they're like, yeah, the cops are finding out that all this stuff starts happening. And I'm like, well, I got to go to the rally. It's my oh, rally. Boy. So I drove all the way back and I met about 50 cars in this tractor parking lot, you know, a tractor or farm, whatever one of those freaking, uh, you know, real man stores. And they're all out there with these flags everywhere. People wearing, hitting their horns. So they put all these flags on my car and they put me second in the parade. And then we go to four different liberal cities all throughout in this area where they hate cops. And we clog up traffic with all our cars, blue line flags, <laughs> horns honking, people flicking us off. I was like, holy cow, we're just driving through. They're flicking us off. This is the way the country was at that point. Yeah. So. We end up getting to the campground where cops had gone in and we're going to all throw their flags out at the same time. We're going to just have this like Viking, fuck you, you know, and New York State Police stopped us. They came uh, out, they had a whole line of them with their mask on, doom, 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 like robots. <laughs> they wouldn't even take bottled water from us because it's looked at as a bribe. That's where they're at. So we ended up going down um, the block at a little parking lot, having a rally. And I was in the back of the truck. And that's why I said, you know, we're going to start something called Cops and Campers. I go, it's going to be something. You know, I was like, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be something to help first responders. We get together and we don't have to worry about this bullshit. Yeah. You know, and here I am two years later. We just went nonprofit in November. We have our fifth event coming up. It's a big one in New York coming up. Got some guests coming to talk. Got a band. We got the hopefully National Guard out there with bounce houses and we've got rock painting, you know, paint of heroes. You know, he's got a yeah. little display there. And it's actually at Spruce Row in Ithaca, New York in July. And that's where that was the first campground that ever reached out to me back when we got suspended. So it's kind of like a, an old school thing with us. So what's your end game for cops and campers? What do you want to get out of that? Well, what we're doing is my, my um, true purpose is to get guys to help obviously with metabolic disease. And obviously there, there are demons that they got in their head. You know, we've all gone through, we've all gone through, even regular sure. people have gone through trauma that they haven't handled, you know, or can't handle or don't know how to handle. But I found these campfires. We did a documentary by accident called Cops and Cabins in 2018. It's on YouTube. Okay. It took eight of us. We went to Blue Ridge Mountains. We didn't all know each other. And one of the guys, Patrick, who did my documentary on cops and campers, he did the cops and cabins one first. And he interviewed us. Mm. And we had different topics of the day. What was the worst day of your life as a police officer? And most of it was something to deal with another officer or maybe a baby, you know, this horrible shit. Right, right. And then most embarrassing day or what boss was just the biggest jerk off? And he, <laughs> oh my God, we would be laughing and joking around and getting all that shit off your chest without anybody coming back to judge you because it's not connected to your department or your friends right. or your circle. And it was so therapeutic that that's what started happening with these campgrounds I was going to. When we get together, we start talking. Oh, Eric, you were in a shooting. What happened? I tell my story. And another guy's, well, he tells his story. And then that helps me. It helps them. And then now, you know, phone call away. You know, you're building a little community. You find out these two guys like to uh, fly fish, even though one's a Philly guy and one's a New York guy. All of a sudden, yeah. now they're busting each other's chops. But it's that part of that group that we had when we'd go to lineup or we go to a little social event where we're all there as brothers and sisters you know except now we're not on duty we can say whatever the hell we want you yeah. know sometimes guys they want to drink beers and just let loose go ahead you know but i 
I'm trying to get guys to be metabolically fit and healthy so they're not pre-diabetic or diabetic so they can enjoy their pensions rather than die within five years, which is half of us guys. All right. We're all obese for the most part. Look at us retiring. We all got too much fat on our bodies and the career is adding fat to you. Even if you eat right, you're still going to be gaining weight. It's just your body's natural reaction to this. So get off the high carbs, get in, get some more meat in your body besides what they're telling you on TV. Cause that's not where the money's at. Go to your local farm, you know, your local uh, farmer's markets, be friends with your farmers. If they're around, go to their farms, get your kids involved. That's what we've done. We're working on a farm now. I mean, who would have thought I'd be chasing pigs around on horses, but <laughs> when you want to eat them, not the horses, I mean the pigs, when you want to eat them, you get really good. So. so you're traveling around the country with your wife and two children. How old are the kids? They're 12 and eight, two boys, two little maniacs. Okay. How long are you going to keep doing this? Do you think? <laughs> it's funny. My mom, our parents, both the, both mother-in-laws, think we are nuts to do this <laughs> how do you guys survive in such tight spaces and well we survive because we go outside you know when you got it you know i got the uh, smoky mountains right behind me i could just take a 20 minute drive we're there or i can just walk the neighborhoods here you know i mean we're just outdoors more you know yeah. even campgrounds have pools and playgrounds and putt putt sure. and local attractions you're just more into and when you're in a new area you're more likely to go check out the area. It's not the same old thing yeah. like you do every day. So, yeah, we travel the country. I meet clients or I help guys along the way that want to talk to me. And they see the flag. And I, who's uh, You're no cop. You're, you're too young. They always say to me, like, is your dad a cop? I'm like, oh, my mom is. You yeah, won't believe that story. But, you know, it's it's just been great. You know, I, I've been able to help thousands of guys on my social media. Acts, you know, I got a lot of cops that reach out. All the podcasts like yours and the other ones, there's always people that reach out that need something, whether they want an event in their town to just get guys together because they lost somebody. You know, mm. the stop sticks stuff of cops getting killed, throwing out stop sticks. I'm just freaking over it. And then, you know, guys that maybe, you know, what my sponsor, what my nonprofit does is try to, you know, when we take the donations, we we're trying to get guys to come to these events and cover their stays and their expenses because these events are time you know we have sure. one in july i can't say it's gonna you know guy needs help in june i can't help you right now you come to our event in july you know that's kind of what we're trying to do with it and provide healthy food doc you know i got a metabolic disease doctor coming to my event in new york i've got kevin donaldson who just wrote a book you know man you're crazy you know it's about ptsd in the job he's coming to hang out with his family and actually talk a little bit to the guys yeah. so that's my goal get this to keep growing in the camping retreat style you know a rally of sorts get guys to befriend each other that maybe they wouldn't have ever talked to and it's a whole nother scene outdoors is healthy you know you need the vitamin d you need to be out there in nature i mean we're indoors way too much even as cops you're like well i'm on road patrol you're still in your car you know you're, you're still right, going into the right. station you're not out there with your vest off and stuff like this and no no that job made me really sick metabolically and i can't express that enough i had heavy molds in my body from probably wearing that vest and all that crap that crappy police department crappy cars i've got heavy metal poisonings arsenic mercury and I also got aluminum, all right? Now we can get into where those comes from. Those come from not only vaccines and booster shots and all that, but it comes from your water, it comes from the environment, and it comes from the food you are eating, okay? Mm -hmm. People don't realize that. And the fillings in your mouth, I'm getting all seven of my mercury fillings taken out because it's slowly poisoning me. So there's a lot of things that are going on besides your weight, guys, and your heart. It's the other things that are going on, the poisons around you, and that's what's happening. I was freaking being poisoned slowly well, with some of my habits. Sorry. I think about like my police career, how much smoke I've eaten. You know, you, you go to a fire, you know, I'm next to the firefighters that got the mask and the bottle and I'm just standing there and, you know, it's black. We call it ghetto smoke. You know, these houses that yeah. are dilapidated, just, you know, they got and, a special smell, don't they? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And you're in these houses that are crawling with cockroaches and other, you know, insect life. And you're just going in the nastiest of the nasty. And, you know, I can't tell you how many friends of mine and myself, I had bladder cancer when I was 40. Oof. And my doctor's like, how did that happen? He said, you got old guy cancer and you're not like chain smoking anything. And I'm like, no, I'm not, you know, but a lot of my friends have gotten cancer, but 
I remember my first district station when I got there, they were getting rid of all the asbestos. They were doing asbestos abatement. Well, there's yeah. guys wearing spacesuits, you know, taking it out of the ceiling tiles, and we're just standing around. We're all sucking it in, man. You know, it's like, well, oh, well, this asbestos thing, what could that hurt? You know, <laughs> years later, we're all getting cancer. It's like, yeah, that might have something to do with it. But yeah, you know, good on you. But how long do you think you'll be like doing this nomadic lifestyle with your family? Do you see right now, doing? while we are looking at homesteading, we do want to be in charge of our food, like eggs, goats, yeah. you know, have some stuff and get involved with the local farmers that we trust their meat. Um, I've slaughtered animals on farms before. I am a suburban kid, you know, playing wow. with remote control cars. And I was on a farm two years ago with a bull that I drove a skid steer on and we're gutting it. And I'm like, holy cow, who would have wow. thought this, you know, and I wasn't used to slaughtering a pig or chickens. Any of that. Still not used to it, but it's, you know, I understand it. You know, I'm sort of right. my kids, but we want to kind of be in control of our food. So we want a homestead, have, you know, five acres to ourselves, Yeah. you know, and then, be able to uh, produce you know like i'm big into the, the healthy snacks for people like fat bombs and stuff like that you know i'm also big into uh bone broth and all kinds of things so mm. if we could market that stuff you know i could coach people in the nutrition yeah. stuff you know promote things i believe in you know what i'm trying to do now is get a job with this company where i'll be a health coach with doctors backing me so if mm. you wanted help and you're like well eric knows what he's talking about but i don't know he's not a doctor you know yeah. well then i'd have a doctor that's a board certified doctor in my world that would then sure. be able to help you and i would be your day-to-day -day guy i mean like all right let's okay. get the results to dr so-and-so well, I would facilitate you go in that direction of a healthier way of living rather than being a, you know, a prisoner of pharmaceutical companies and, you know, your Walgreens visits every week. Yeah. So it's just another way to help people. That's what the plan's going to be. Now if things okay. change and I got to go, I'm not going to take, I'm not putting that gun belt on again. I can't, it's, oh, too, yeah. it's I... too damaging to me Right. because I was, I love that job. I took it to heart. Yeah. You know, and, well, let me ask you this. I mean, we'll start bringing this to a close. What do you miss okay. the most about the job? What I, I guess the excitement getting into it. Yeah. You know, like we did a, you know, a short story. It was a, a burglary suppression and you're waiting for the bad guys to hit some house in this neighborhood. And then he does. And you, you're behind oh. this guy about that kind of shit. I don't miss the politics. I don't miss right. the sadness of what I saw in society. I mean, we go on these long distance drives, you know, I'm towing my rig and my kids are like, dad, tell us a cop story. Yeah, and is. it's hard for me to find good ones, man. Yeah, it sure is. It might be a good one, but it's tied to something bad. Oh yeah, right. well, this guy was hanging from the bridge. And next thing <laughs> yeah. you know, Johnny got caught on the bridge with the shorts, you know, yeah. like the dead guy right there. I mean, how do you tell your poor kid that? Right. You know? right. But I do tell him way too much. I'll tell him about the stinkers. I tell him about, shotguns to the head what's left of it you know i told him about my shooting you know i i have like autopsy i got everything one day you know they okay. can sit down and look at that and you know it's yeah i the only things i ever say that are funny it's usually a funny story with me that yeah. nobody knows about like one of my first sure. traffic stops for getting the put the car in park and it's rolling right with me as I'm walking up to the car and then we've all done it. Right. Yep. So they get kicks out of that, leaving my paperwork on the car and driving away. Sure. You know, people clapping, ah, I cop lost a ticket book, you know, yep. that, picking them up and, you know, cause now you get in trouble if you don't have your damn tickets anymore. Right. So, right. But oh, that's yeah, that's, funny. that's a sad thing, man. I, I felt like, man, there should be more good stories. I mean, I was on a show with a paramedic the other day and I was telling him, I saw them bring back a kid on Christmas Day that had drowned. I was in the ambulance, you know, part of the oh, wow. chain of custody. And they brought yeah. that kid to life. And it was, wow, that's when I realized as a rookie, the power that we have that really in helping people and all first responders, not, you know, not just sure. cops. And it was like, wow, I was like, that's why we do this job, you know. And certain people would be frozen in that situation, you know. Right. So Absolutely. that's why we all can't be cops, you know. Well, I, I like to ask people that have been through a lot and you've been through a ton, you know, did your faith in a higher power get stronger or diminish when you went through all this, you know, looking back? All right. So I got caught cheating in Bible school, right? <laughs> so I knew my route in life wasn't going to be in fatherhood or priesthood or anything like that. Um, my wife and I are very spiritual. 
my wife is of Turkish descent. Um, her family is Muslim. So I'm very open minded. I've studied mm -hmm. religion now, not in school, but on my own. You right. know, um, honestly, that job makes me not believe in a lot. I will tell you, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but for me personally, right. the things I saw over time, the way human behavior is, the dregs and the sad and the the sick shit, right? So it was real hard for me to try to find something positive mm -hmm. in that, you know, and especially when you're in it. Now, you know, we are more spiritual. I am more outdoors, you know, in nature more. I'm more connected to this earth and into a, some kind of a power. I'm not saying it's Jesus or it's the Catholic side of things or the Muslim side of things, but there is a spirit in me, you know, and my mom, you know, my middle name is Michael. You know, she named that St. Michael. She gave me the yeah, St. Michael's absolutely. charm. That charm was in my vest on the day of my shooting. Yep. You know, my first name is Eric. I was named after Eric the Red, the Viking. And my grandmother was like, you can't give him a pagan name. He's got to have a Christian name in there. <laughs> yeah. That's how Michael came in there. So I've had a, I've danced with it. And, but deep down, it's a spiritual connection to this world, but it's in my own way. You know, it's, I don't need church for me. I can go, but I don't need it on a day-to-day -day basis. But I do need the friendships and the camaraderies that sometimes happen from those organizations or getting, you know, getting involved in some of those communities. It's healthy on some level. You yeah, know. you know, you know, I was brought up strict Irish Catholic, you know, you know, 95% of Ireland is Catholic. So yeah. the other 5% are Martians, you know, according to my mother, you know, but, you know <laughs> that, there is no such thing, you know, but, you know, when people go through traumatic events, you know, sometimes, you know, there's no atheists in foxholes, you know, I've right. seen it where people you like either blame God or thanking God or, and then, you know, it's like, I had a partner that shot seven people in his career. You know, he, he's been through the ringer and he became like a born again Christian. And I could totally see how that happened. Yeah, you know, he, you know, and but I've seen both extremes, and then atheists, agnostics, you know, that are like, no, there's nothing. I've seen all of this horrible stuff. You know, how can there be, right. you know, a god? But then you see, it's like, okay, this guy is shot nine times, and he's walking out of the ER an hour, you know, a couple hours later with Snoopy band aids on him, and you're like, okay, you know, there's got to be something, man. This this doesn't make any sense to me, you know. You so, like uh, Pulp Fiction, right? Remember yes. when Samuel Jackson was talking about divine intervention and then yep. John Travolta's like, you're full of shit, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> they go back and forth. Yes. That is me, dude, to the T. Oh, yeah. There's times where I'm like, this is happening. Look where I'm at in life. It's all part of a plan, you right. know? I don't know who's control or maybe I'm already AI and I don't even know it. Yeah. <laughs> or it's it's some, Or I'm just like, that's exactly why. You know, I've gone through that because I've lost... You know, one of my best friends, Joe Crowder, I went to Academy with jogging and he had stents put in previously. So that, you know, when they told me about stents, I was like, whoa, you guys already killed my bud. Yeah. You know, so it's just like, you know, it, it's just a crazy situation. And what I found, pot, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these tragedies like Joe, I was at one of my heaviest when he died of his heart attack. When Al Joe died of a heart attack, I never really maybe would have looked at my own health. Yeah. And then I was able to look at my own heart disease and my own, you know, issues that were going on with diabetes and where I was headed because well, I, of Joe's Jeff. And it's a shame, but that's what it took. And, you know, right. I, I'm like, not going to let it go to waste. For me, I look at genes like my grandma lived to 96. She drank every day since she was like 10. She smoked, you know, ate the worst foods possible. But she was always a little on the lean side. And she walked everywhere. She worked, you know, they immigrated to the south side of Chicago. They never had a car. They didn't, she never had a driver's license. She And she would walk literally a mile to save five cents on a gallon of milk. But, you know, the doctor would be like, Bridget, you've got the blood pressure and heart rate of a teenager. How do you do this? You know, and it's, and again, she's drinking whiskey and brandy by the juice glass. And I'm like, holy shit, grandma, you know, was like, and she, she was, wasn't... she was really vibrant and like active right up till the end. She made it to 96. 
that's how we were before pharma started medicating us all, right? Yeah. So I just, all our wise people are dying off now of, of Alzheimer's and dementia, oh. which we never had till 1979 when it was diagnosed. Man, so, man. yeah, that's another thing. I, these older generations were definitely a lot tougher than we were. <laughs> oh, boy, that's no lie. Holy cow. So let's wrap this up here. You know, okay. let me ask you this. What would you do if your kids wanted to become cops? We have that discussion because okay. the last thing I, I want them to do is get in to be or become a cops. And all I do. So then they them, are. <laughs> then they will because he's so <laughs> they know muzzle control and discipline when we're shooting. They know right. what are you doing? I'm downrange. Are you kidding me? Yeah, da -da. So, sure. And then I teach them how to building searches because we're playing nerf battles, right? Right. Well, I'm training them by accident, not on purpose. But <laughs> what I hope for them is they're more outdoorsy kids. You know, we've okay. been homeschooling. We happened to pull them out in 2018 before the nonsense. And look what happened. I mean, everything, yeah. like I said, I'm on some path. I don't know who's in control of it, but I thought if they did anything, it'd be some type of um, maybe rescue out mm -hmm. in the, maybe do some type of wilderness type of something like okay. that type of enforcement. This street cop in a city, no way. I will do everything I can because that call to call domestic, domestic, it's a numbers game. And yeah. your day may come a lot. Of, it may come at any time. But to me, I know that I know cops are in other states that had barely the call volume I had and never had anything happen. And I had a bunch of calls and I had a bunch of shit happen. So yeah. to me, the busier the city, more likely going to get into some shit. And I don't want to go through that stress. I mean, having to call my mom and tell her I got oh, shot yeah. and then her wanting me to pass the phone off to a boss because she wasn't believing me. I don't, I don't know what she was thinking. She just wanted a <laughs> boss to tell her. No, not me. <laughs> That's so funny. I gave it to my buddy Frank as a sergeant. He's like, yes, yes, he's got shot, but he's fine. No, no, no. So, yeah, I don't want to go through that. Um, right. If anything, they're going to be in the um, health end of things and in maybe training. You know, I am doing the personal training and the new nutritionist yeah. stuff. So their eyes are opened up to all of the nutrition side of things. Kids nutrition is very huge in our family and they teach their friends about stuff. You know, pork rinds instead of Doritos, you know, stuff like that. Okay. So hopefully they're not cops one day, but, you know, it's in their blood. My brother, Dave, when on one of the interviews, he goes, we, you know, we come from a warrior spirit. Yep. And that is in us and it's generational and it may be tough to keep them out of making a difference. But I tell you what, they're not going overseas to fight some other rich man's war. I'll tell you that. Right. <laughs> okay. We'll tell you what, what advice would you give to rookie cops that might be listening or somebody considering a career in law enforcement? Oh, the best advice I would probably say is nutrition. Learn how to fast on duty. Don't be worried about eating so much on duty because that's okay. going to help you out later on. All right. Good enough. So when's the book or the podcast coming out? You got a lot know, of man. stuff going on, man. I need help. Anyone wants to help me out, man. We need help. My mom's got a whole book in herself, but yeah, she does. We got, I actually got an outline done. I've got, it's called uh, the heart of a lion. So I never okay. know. I don't know what we're going to go with it. Cause it's um got my mom's, my mom's life is fascinating, man. That's oh, yeah. When her doing the decoding of messages from Cuba and all that stuff back in the day, I mean, I just sit back and I'm like, wow, someone needs to write a, uh, something about my mom. And then I realized I'm part of it. <laughs> pretty, yeah. I mean, it's pretty yeah, surreal. <laughs> I think that's two books, maybe three, you know, one, your mom, one, you, and maybe a combo of the both of you. I, I don't know, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff here or at least a podcast. I, I could totally see like with the cops and campers and all that, you know, Hey, we could do um, podcasts right from there and probably have a bunch yep. of bunch of guys that would be willing to talk for 15 20 minutes and oh, yeah there's indeed. definitely material available so. oh yeah all right well good enough hey, well where are you at right now wisconsin oh I, I you said that early i didn't know you're still there <laughs> yeah i'm still here but we're looking to move into florida so yeah i'm sick of this okay. i'm done with it i'm beyond done with it all so, right well we'll get you to a cops and campers show uh yes it's rallies um i know july if i have to say it's july 11th through the 13th in ithaca new york is our third event up there and it's going to be it's already sold out so i mean you can drive up and still attend the event but you can't mm -hmm. camp there it's already well cool. i'm so not a big awesome. camper mosquitoes love me for some reason ah, there's remember, some mosquitoes up there dude i remember camping with <laughs> my kids and my ex-wife we had a pop-up camper and, you know, we, we did it quite often and we'd be wherever. And I mean, these little bastards would be like sucking all of the blood out of me and like carrying me away. Well, my, 
attacks and the what, kids are like there's no mosquitoes here dad <laughs> and i'm like yes you know, there are there's lots of mosquitoes you know your blood type no i do not they also like high carb people by the way so if you're sugary <laughs> I, meaning li- they I like you. sweet <laughs> okay, okay i'll say it you're like the sweet nectar walking around <laughs> great <laughs> we'll tell you disgusting as that sounds <laughs> <laughs> tell us where we could learn more about you and all the cool stuff you're involved in where do they go well, the, the two places is keto 50.com it's k-e-t-o like keto 5 f-i-v-e-o um, that's all social media, my website. And then also, if you want to look up the Cops and Campers site, that's copsandcampers.com. And we do have, we're all over social media there, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, and also, we have, what's I going to say? Yeah, that's pretty much where you can find me. I do have a YouTube channel. It has all my shootings and other podcasts I've done and other helpful tips about nutrition and I know I didn't explain how I lost pretty much 80 pounds, except for keto. I did go carnivore for a while, heavy animal based, you know, meats, vegetable, I'm sorry, meats and cheeses and broths and stuff. And that was a good way to just clear my system out and reboot it to find out what my body can react to and what it doesn't. And, you know, now I can have a slice of sourdough bread. So it's not a end of the world to just try to give up that stuff. You're just overfueled. That's what it is. You got too much fuel in your system. We got to get rid of it. So, all right. Look me great. up, Keto 50. I'm helping all you first responders. Let's get rid of that 50 pounds. I'll give you a challenge coin if you do. So, <laughs> all right. Very good. All right, buddy. Thank you so much for being on the show. All right, brother. Thanks.